Check one, two, check, 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 check. Check, 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 check. Just put this stuff I didn't. away somewhere. All right. No, I can't. No. The, the laptop. Well, Mike told me he gave me water, and I don't see any. Hey, before we start, 
Yeah. Oh, Super Bowl okay. Square, St. Anthony High School softball. <laughs> it's for a fundraiser, I Venmo and PayPal. <laughs> See me <Everybody>, after. <laughs> is everybody ready? Are you good, Vivian? Yes. Can I start? Me or okay. Welcome everyone to the January 23rd uh, Board of Trustees uh, session meeting. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order uh, and um, we're gonna have um, Vice President Malaula lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance. Can you please all stand. Flag. All right, everybody, right hand over your heart, begin. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, let's do the roll call, Madam Secretary. Here. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Uduak Joe Intuk. Here. Doug Otto. Here. Sunny Zia. Here. And student trustee, Danielle Jones. Here. Okay, item uh, 2.4, report on closed session item um, 1.4, I believe. And item, item 1.5, the board held a conference in closed session with legal counsel to consider a settlement regarding existing litigation related to dispute regarding a student's dismissal. Uh, the board took action to approve the settlement agreement by a unanimous vote with, with all trustees present. The parties agree that upon execution of the agreement, LBCCD shall return to student the $500 paid by the student for tuition and counter course materials. Student agrees to waive all current and future known and unknown, suspect or unsuspected, anticipated or unanticipated claims against LBCCD uh, arising from the current matter. This settlement agreement shall not in any way be construed as an admission by Long Beach Community College District of any acts of wrongdoings whatsoever against students or any other person. Long Beach Community College District and students specifically disclaim any liability to or wrongdoing and or violation of any law, policy, rule, or contract whatsoever. Okay, we will now move on to item 2.5, approval of minutes of the December 11th, uh, 2018, regular Board of Trustees meeting. Um, do I have a motion? Uh, so moved. Trustee Intuk, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice President Malaulu. Um, let's call the roll. Can I make one? Oh, sure. There was one item I was looking through. There was a misspelling of the name Rosie Patterson in the uh, closing portion of it. It had uh, Rosie Patterson, but it should be R-O-S-I and then P-E-T-E-R-E-S-E-N, Patterson. That was the only change I saw. Good eye. She noted. Okay, with that um, ch change, ministerial change, can we go ahead and call the... Virginia oh. Baxter. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Joe Intuk? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. Student Trustee Jones? Aye. Item 2.6, Superintendent President, Dr. Romali? Good evening, everyone. It's so good to see everyone here tonight at our fabulous PCC campus that we love having our board meetings at. Uh, we were here just yesterday passing out donuts, so we, had, we always have a really good time when we come to PCC. Um, I want to draw your attention to the Campus Community Newsletter. Please pick one up that's outside. I want to thank Joshua Castellanos, the head of our marketing department, and Marinda Martin, who does such a spectacular job. Uh, they have really upped their game, so I hope you enjoy that. Um, you also will see in your packets um, food bank and homeless shelter and service center housing resources for our students. So please, 
We want to make as many people aware of these resources as possible. Paolo, uh, we would love to get this out to as many students as possible, so we'll, we will work with you to be able to get that word out. I also would like to recognize, he couldn't join us tonight, but Stephen Hall is retiring from the position of stadium maintenance technician after 29 years of wonderful service, so we thank Stephen for his service. I want to uh, welcome everyone back for Happy New Year. Winter session is well underway, and please don't forget to tell your friends that our spring session starts February 6th, and we'd love to have you enroll. And we're happy to have our first board meeting at the PCC campus of 2019. With regard to the state budget, our first bud in his first budget, Governor Gavin Newsom, his budget embraced and built upon California Community College's efforts to build a skilled and educated workforce through responsive educational programs, quality, and affordable transfer. So there are some notable expenditures in his 1920 budget that I wanted you to know about. He is proposing that second year of free tuition to first-time, full-time uh, students, which came out of the Long Beach College Promise from 2008. He would like to increase the award amounts and the expansion of the Cal Grant program, and he would also like to buy down the K-14 PERS and STRS rates. Uh, which Vice President Drinkwine has told us are hitting us so severely. So we're going to continue to work with our local um, and state um, representatives as we lobby our particular interests. I want to congratulate Vice President Drinkwine. LBCC was awarded the 2018 Board of Governors Energy and Sustainability Award. And uh, we were designated a California Community College's Sustainability Champion. So I want to congratulate you and your entire team on that. That's extremely important. Um, with, with regard to partnerships, part of Promise 2.0 is more than just getting students into school. It's more than just getting them out of school. It's getting them hooked up with either a transfer opportunity or a job. So we're not just offering a degree. We're offering you a life. That's a very big deal. Um, we have announced our first partnership is Promise 2.0 is with the Port of Long Beach. You're also going to be seeing some February activity where we will have a signing event with the terminal operators at the Port of Long Beach and the City of Lakewood is going to come on board. And so Promise Partners is really going to become very popular with industry partners. I also want to thank Trusty Doug Otto. He went with a group at 5.30 in the morning over on a boat to the city of Avalon, um, hosted by Mayor Annie Marshall. And they visited and met with high school seniors to discuss opportunities to join LBCC in terms of financial aid, how to live on campus, how to get student support services. And he just received a wonderful thank you letter for her, and I want to thank him. They had a very long, probably 15-hour day there with no seasickness reported. It was, um, it was a long way to row. Yeah, it was. <laughs> did, did you swim? <laughs> um, also, um, many of you have been so excited about the marketing that's taking place. You know, we held faculty and staff forums, and we heard that the faculty and staff wanted more marketing and mailing materials in the, in the community. And you have seen a beautiful brochure um, created by uh, Joshua's team that, that is outside. Please pick one up that was mailed to over 230 residences. You also got uh, a community education guide, and the phone is ringing off the hook with regard to particularly our home renovation uh, program seems to be very popular. And a third brochure is going to drop um, on the late start classes soon. So thank you to the faculty, staff, and administrators who gave us these great ideas. Enrollment trends, you're going to hear an incredible presentation tonight. I promise you it will only be about 25 minutes. But it is a 150-page presentation that talks about everything that we have done on recruitment, retention, persistence, and completion at LBCC over the last year. And if this doesn't show you how hard every single person at this institution works on behalf of our students, I don't know what does. Because this is, the, this is it. This is the heart of what we do. Um, enrollment was down in the fall, 6%. We took a horrible hit. We're up 6% in winter. And we're trending slightly about 1% down for sp uh, spring, but it's not over yet, and we're not done, and we're working very, very hard. This is, unfortunately, a statewide trend, and you're going to hear more about that this evening. 
High school counselors. We hosted 120 counselors from LBUSD, Paramount USD, and Linwood USD for our first counselor breakfast in 10 years. Uh, it was a big hit. Um, it was super spirited and very tremendous. Um, we have a love market. Uh, there was food distribution at PCC where students received resource information about our Healthy Viking program and were able to shop for groceries. And I want to give a special shout out and thank you to the El Dorado Women's Club who donated individually wrapped food items to our vaults. And the trustees have been presented with the copies of those information sheets that talk about the housing and the shelter so that you can uh, answer questions with your constituents. We attended a wonderful uh, Long Beach State of the City presented by Mayor Robert Garcia. We attended the Foundation Board of Governors breakfast. We participated in the MLK parade. And today we heard from Executive Director Mario Cordero about the state of the port. Now there were a thousand attendees in today and they had the state of the port uh, program. And guess what's on the back? Thank you, Joshua Castellanos, LBCC's Maritime Center for Excellence. We uh, are shameless, and in, 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 we will market the, our fabulous programs anywhere. I want you to be aware of upcoming events at LBCC. At LAC, there's Career Technology Day on February 15th, and at PCC, it's on February 20th. And um, also, State of the College is being slightly redesigned this year. It will not be the Friday before. We're going to do two separate events. We're going to do one for our community and one for our internal since it is two different messages that people are interesting, interested in hearing, it will be much more experiential where we can really show off what our faculty and staff are doing. And we are dramatically cutting the cost so that we can drive that money back into student scholarship. So you'll still have a fantastic experience and students will be able to go to college. Um, we also had an incredible breakfast last week put together by Marcia Parker, Senior Director of Community Relations, with over 100 counselors and faculty from the ABC Unified School District. So we are very excited about telling everyone about the great opportunity here at LBCC. Madam President, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent President Dr. Romali. Fabulous report as always. Uh, boy, you guys are busy. It makes me feel like a slacker uh, coming here and listening to your report. Um, ASB uh, President Report, John Paolo, welcome. Good evening. I like your glasses, John Paolo. Thank you so much. Very I'm nice. trying to be expressive today because I was so happy today. So, uh, just because I got a, an email, uh, because I got a, I'm a dean's sister, so I was like, I need to just oh, great today. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's fantastic. We're so proud of you, John Paolo. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone, again, and Happy New Year. Welcome back. So for my report, um, the Associated Student Body will be having our um, spring retreat on January 31st and February 1st. And I want to extend the invitation to the Board of Trustees and President Romali to have an interaction with the student leaders and be informed with the updates of the college. So um, a formal invitation has been sent to Jockey Hein and um, the administ administrative assistant of Dr. Romali so we have a schedule that has been sent and you guys can sque squeeze in from 20 to 30 minutes and just, you know, we just want, really, really want to interact with you guys. And, you know, like it's, it's a tradition. So last year, um, October 2017, we had a chance to interact with the board of trustees and it was uh, probably the best experience of my life that motivated me to run for president because, you know, um, I really want to hear from you guys, you know, in this perspective, like outside of this room, because. I feel like there's a, sometimes like I get really intimidated because I need to like act so professional, but I wanna know, like know you guys more in person. So hopefully I exp hopefully you guys will, will give like a few minutes of your time to visit our spring retreat. And then um, next, um, for my next report is the student trustee, um, Donald Jones, um, and I are actually are beginning to plan a town hall on during the spring semester. Um, the Student Senate for California, uh, California Community Colleges um, asked us to host for our region, and I'm really excited to you know, start a town hall. And we really want to interact with our, not only the students of our college, but also you know, inviting um, other, um, other community colleges in our region. And that, that's the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you, John Paolo. We're certainly very proud of you for your 
great accomplishments, and you always make us proud. Everyone is afraid to mess up. I, I am always. Um, so um, you're, you're doing fantastic. Um, now, before I move on to item 2.8, I want to recognize that we have uh, Lieutenant Omar Martinez here with us, which is, makes it extra special. Thank you for being here. Um, and also want to recognize um, the lovely and beautiful Emily Rasmussen, who's here. Um, welcome to the PCC campus. Um, She's with the Press Telegram. Uh, Adam 2.8, student trustee, Donnell Jones, another one of our pride and joys of the district. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, there's not much left to report after uh, our ASB president pretty much summed up uh, what's important uh, within the uh, ASB uh, student body. Um, just wanted to kind of echo that we do have a retreat on the 31st and the 1st, and we would love to see our, our wonderful trustees there. Um, to be able to meet and work with all of our, our, our great cabinet members. Um, also wanted to give a special shout out to our social science department. Um, I just recently found out that as a department, they've, uh, they've, they're working together to provide, um, I guess, sort of uh, mini Viking bolts in their offices uh, for hungry students. I wanted to give a shout out to that. And I also heard that I believe the math and nursing departments will also be doing the same. Thank you guys once again for your dedication to our students. They definitely appreciate it. Um, and also, I recently learned about a, a, a new program that I'm hoping that can be expanded um, to more of our classes, and I can learn some more about uh, the Day One Solutions, which has been able to uh, help students be able to have access to their digital uh, content on the first day of class without having to worry about uh, fronting the cost up front. And that is uh, the end of my report. Thanks again for coming here, and welcome to 2019, everybody. Thank you, student trustee Donnell Jones. Uh, it's always a pleasure hearing your report. And we'll now move on to 2.9, OBCC FA bargaining president. Welcome, Kristen Moreno. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Happy New Year again to everyone. I think I've spoken with almost everyone up here in the last three weeks, so nice to see you again. I want to begin by thanking the administration for the clear lines of communication that I've had with you in the last few weeks. You've made yourself available when I've had to represent faculty or ask for clarification on things, and so I just want to express a thank you to you for that. And I hope that this communication with faculty continues into the new year. I know there is a lot of work to be done at the college, and I really wanted to spend just a few minutes today to highlight the collaborations um, that faculty have with other constituency groups on campus and what they're doing to support student success. So if you could give me just a couple minutes of your time, I'd like to share some of that work. Last fall, faculty participated in the re-enrollment campaign for winter and spring, and a number of faculty are working hard on equitizing their syllabi. Currently, the counseling department will be offering seven CPR counseling plus registration events to support spring enrollment at both campuses. And faculty in the counseling are also working at the welcome centers on both campuses to assist students with registration and to answer any career objective and goals questions that they may have. I'm really proud to share what ESL is doing. ESL faculty have helped to create six brand new non-credit certificates and a new academic program in American Sign Language and Deaf Studies, including five new classes and an associate's degree. These classes are on all three GE plans and students completing our program can transfer seamlessly into CSULB's brand new bachelor program in deaf studies. So quite an accomplishment from, from ESL faculty. The math and English departments are working hard on creating their co-rec classes, um, courses to help address equity gaps that we have right now, and allowing our students to complete and transfer sooner. And this spring, FA is committed to assisting our Campus Healthy Vikings program and identifying faculty on campus who could be hubs for students in need while they're on our campus. And lastly, I want to thank Superintendent President Dr. Ramali and Dr. Munoz 
for your ongoing work with campus safety efforts. It's truly appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kristen. Um, we will now move on to item 2.10, AFT bargaining president's report. I don't see uh, Susan here. So we will move on to item 2.11. Uh, Chai, a bargaining president's report. Is Karen here? I don't see her either. Um, item 2.12, reordering of the agenda. I didn't get any requests to reorder the agenda, but I'm going to ask. Uh, okay. Item 2.13, um, public comments on agenda items. The public is allowed to address the board before or during the co consideration of any item on the Agenda and a total of three minutes will be allotted to each speaker with a maximum of 20 minutes to each subject unless extended by the board president. I do not have any no requests. requests. Okay, great. We will now move on to item 3.1, 2016 to 2022 strategic plan revisions. This is an action item and the action, the recommended action is that the board of trustees approve the 2016-2022 strategic plan including revisions and mission statement as submitted. Dr. Heather Van Valkenberg, a Dean of Institutional Effectiveness, will present the 2016 and 2022 strategic plan, including these revisions and mission statement. Dr. Let me make sure I'm doing this right. Valkenberg, go ahead, the floor is thank, yours. Thank you, President Zia. Um, Board of Trustees, uh, Superintendent President Romali, Vice Presidents, faculty, staff, administrators, students, and members of the community. Um, I'm gonna just talk very quickly about some changes we're making to the strategic plan. So if you recall in the November Board of Trustees meeting, this microphone feels a little bit loud for me. Um, if you recall, there was a review of some of the language in the goals and a wonderful recommendation about adding equity to some of the language in the goals. Sure, get it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's very slow. I'll keep talking while it goes up. <laughs> um, and so we took that, that suggestion back through our governance process and reviewed the language and came up with a proposed change that was approved, and now we want to bring it to you all to approve. Through that process, we also identified that our mission statement had been changed just a little bit from when we were having it in our earlier version of the strategic plan. So I'm just gonna show you quickly that language change. Um, so you can see with our 2011 to 16 mission statement with that strategic plan, we're saying the word promotes. So I'm not gonna read the whole paragraph. And then in our new mission statement, we have changed promotes to is committed to providing. And so that is the, the element that we're looking for approval on. I'll go ahead and go to the next slide to show the goals. So the four goals, except for goal two, are the same language. And in goal two, we added and close equity gaps to really help reflect the intention of the activities and objectives under that goal, but at the higher level as well. So that is essentially um, what we're proposing here, so thank you. Perfect. Um, do we have any questions? Um, we need a, I believe we need a motion on this. Um, is there a motion? A move. Uh, moved by Trustee Intook, seconded by Trustee Otto. Are there any questions, comments? I'd just like to say thank you for uh, following through on this. I know this was some discussion we had a few months back about updating it. And I, I think as we, as a city, continue to look at addressing equity, that it's not just a promotional item, but a commitment that we share across the campus. So I'm uh, very pleased to see we're able to like, get that updated and be an official goal of the, of the college. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic job. and. This uh, goes to the great work of your team and the great leadership of our superintendent president, Dr. Romali, mm -hmm. um, for always following through with commitments. Thank you so much. Um, can we take a vote, Madam Secretary? Mm -hmm. Virginia Baxter? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduak Joanne Tuck? Aye. Doug Otto? Aye. Sunny Zia? Aye. Student Trustee Jones? Aye. All right, we will now move on to item 3.2. Nomination for, um, I, I like to call it triple CT, I'm probably not doing it right, the board election 2019, this is an action item. 
Um, the recommended action, and it is my pleasure that the Board of Trustee nominate Trustee Urbach Joe Intuk to be candidate for the California Community College Trustees um, Triple CT Board, and that the nominating forms be forwarded to the Community College League of California on or before February 15, 2019. As submitted, uh, California Community College Trustees Board Elections 2019, the Board of Trustee nominates Trustee Uruak Joe Intuk to be a candidate for the California Community College Trustees Board and that the nominating force be forwarded uh, by February 15. Each uh, member of the District Board of Trustees will have one vote for each open seat on the Triple CT board and no more than one trustee per district may serve on the board. The election will take place between March 10th and April 29th, 25th, 2019. Is there a motion? So moved. Uh, tr trustee uh, Otto, I think, uh, was first. Trustee Baxter was seconded. Um, okay, uh, are there any questions, comments? Would you like to say a few words, Trustee Intuk, before we take the vote? No, well, just uh, thank you for the nomination. Appreciate the confidence of my colleagues and look forward to, uh, I, I guess I have to campaign uh, <laughs> statewide to, to get this. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. So thank you. Uh, Trustee Intuk, I, um, I looked at this and I thought this would be a, a fabulous opportunity for you to really get integrated in the state. And I know Trustee Otto has been doing it for some time. Is that right, Trustee Otto? Um, and he can, he certainly has a, quite a bit of insight um, that may help uh, help you, and we're gonna be all rooting for you. So let's go ahead and take a vote. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Chowinta. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And Student Trustee Jones. Aye. All right, we will now move on to item 4.1, student success. Um, the Cal California Community College Chancellor's Office's scoreboard. Uh, we have a presentation, again, by Dr. Heather Van Volkenberg, a Dean of In Institutional Effectiveness. She'll present the report, and um, I, I understand that we're, in, in the spirit of brevity, we're trying to stick to a timeline for all our presentations. So just, I just ask uh, my colleagues that we reserve questions till the end, if that is okay with you all. All right, good, let's go ahead. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present this. Um, so as President Zia said, we'll be presenting the Chancellor's Office scorecard. Um, this is a screenshot of our website. We are legally required to have a link on our website for you to access it. So this is where you can find it at the bottom of the website. We're also legislated to provide a presentation to the Board of Trustees on this data. And so that's what I'm here doing today. Um, I really want to make sure that we're clear as we go into looking at the outcomes, the cohorts that we're talking about. So the majority of the outcomes that I have listed here, and I'll talk about the outcomes in detail when we look at the data specifically, but we're talking about a six-year cohort. So we're looking at students that came in in 2011-2012 um, for the majority of our, our data outcomes. There are two that we have slightly newer cohorts for. So you can see we are looking at a three-year cohort, 14-15, and then also a two-year cohort for 15-16. The reason I want to emphasize this at the outset is just the importance in thinking about best practices in data-driven decision-making is looking at the data at the time of need and making changes based on that. When we're looking at cohorts this far back, we're not necessarily able to make changes as quickly, and so I just want to keep that on people's radar as we're talking about these data. So the first set of outcomes we'll talk about is um, related to remedial math, English, and DSL throughputs. So again, we're looking at that six-year cohort. These are credit students who attempted a course in math, English, or ESL and completed a college-level math or English course within those six years. So if you look at the math, we can see we're a little bit lower than the state average. If you look at our English, we're a little bit higher than the state average. And if you look at our ESL throughput, we're, we're lower than the state average. Continuing quickly on, we're now looking at a two-year cohort. And so this is looking at first-time students who came in in 14-15, earned a minimum of six units, and attempted a math or English course in their first year, 
and completed a transfer level math or English course by their second year. So you can see with the math, we're hitting in about half the state average. With English, we're also coming in about half the state average. One thing to keep in mind here is that this is something we've already worked on addressing. So we'll talk about it in the next slide set, but there's legislation in place and we've actually moved faster than the legislation requires to provide improvements in students hitting those transfer level courses. So we're already working on this using the data we have now. Um, Additional outcomes that I'm gonna talk about are these milestones, so we're gonna look at persistence. And so these are first time students who've earned at least six units and attempted math or English, and then in the first three years, and then either stayed for those first three consecutive primary terms, or completed at least 30 units within the six years. And so those are the two things we're looking at. With persistence, we're landing a little bit higher than state average. But as we talk about in the next slideshow, you'll see that persistence is actually a problem where we're having decreased um, persistence. And so that's data that we're looking at in real time, knowing now what our issues are and addressing them rapidly, rather than waiting for six years to see if our persistence rate is still meeting state average. Um, for 30 units completion, we're hitting uh, pretty much the same as the state average for that cohort. Uh, moving on, we're looking at degree transfer, and the way that the Chancellor's Office does this is they're actually reporting awards for degrees and certificate, four-year transfer, or transfer preparedness all combined. So these students can achieve one or all of those, right? So it's all combined. Um, again, they, trans they define transfer prepared as completing those 60 UCCSU transferable units with at least 2.0 GPA. We're a little bit lower than the state average. We've already looked at our data that's more recent relating to completions. We're already making a lot of efforts to improve that um, and looking at our transfer data as well. So these are things that we'll talk about in the next deck as well. Um, CTE certificate completion and CDCP certificate completion. So the definition is really focusing on the CTE course completion. So this is students who completed um, a CTE course in at least eight units within three years and then got a certificate or a transfer or were transfer prepared. CDCP, it's essentially the same except they're doing CDCP coursework rather than CTE <coughs> coursework. You can see for both, we're a little bit lower than the state average, but as we've talked about, Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, career development and college preparation. Thank you. And so you can see we're a little bit below the state average, but as we've been moving forward, looking at our current data, we've been making a lot of changes in our processes and looking at our programs to help improve those outcomes. Um, skills builders, this is our uh, cohort from 2014-2015. And basically we're looking at students who took CTE coursework and then did not continue on an academic track and did not transfer to a four-year, right? So we know they're coming in, they're getting skills that they need, they're moving on into the workforce. Um, and we can see we actually have a higher than average wage gain for those students. And we can also see the highest enrolled disciplines and where those median percent changes are occurring. Thank you. All right, um, so uh, this was an in, uh, information uh, only item. Is, are there any questions, comments, or we will move on to, yes, Trustee Antuk? Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. Is, is the, for, the, the format we're looking at with the, the chain, the shorter two and three year cohort and the breakout, does that match the new funding formula criteria that we're, we're driven by going forward, or is this uh, the standard? methodology for right no evaluating. no that's a really great question um the skills builders is a relatively new cohort that they added in i think a year or two ago but essentially this data this will probably be the last time that we do this presentation because of all the changes with the funding formula the vision for success and other things going on at the chancellor's office they're kind of phasing out these data and having a new set of simplified metrics that we'll also be presenting at some point in the future and last question is this our annual scorecard that's on the Chancellor's website now? Yes. And that went live as of this month, or? No, it went live, I think, in September. Okay. So it's, it's been live it's for the, a few it months. It's the previous yes. academic year. Exactly, um, and so we look at a, we're looking at this 10-11 cohort, and so it takes them six years up to 17, 18 to actually complete all of the six-year cycle of things, and then we have the year following to do the presentation. So that's what we're in, it's that presentation year. Is there um, any other questions? Trustee Otto? So um, we have our own scorecard. 
Yes. And it's much more complicated and nuanced than these, but this is what, a, what the state requires us to post and talk about. But um, given the changes in the funding formula, yeah. which mean that it's no longer just based on full-time equivalent students, but it's based on success and, and, and other things, um, it gives us uh, an approach to achieving what it is that we need to achieve in, both in enrollment and in success and uh, that, that, that is different. And, uh, and I think it's important to note that, that we use both of those. I mean, we're, we're, I won't say required to do the same thing, although we are, but it provides a little information. What we're doing is providing a lot more information to, uh, to uh, work from. Um, I, I, I've always felt that the, the big issue for us is always uh, improving course success. And if we can improve our course success, then what we're, what we're doing is, uh, and, and basically, it, we got to get them in the door. Uh, that's, that's always been a little bit of a challenge, not because there aren't people that want to get here, but it's the rate of people that we actually process who want to be here. But then once they're here, it's getting them here in the spring as well as in the fall and crossing our fingers in the fall and then in the next fall. Uh, and they do that by completing courses. And if they complete courses, then they're well on the way to uh, what it is. I, I, will, I would also note that um, uh, President Romali said that we were down about 6% uh, in terms of our enrollment in the fall, but I think that most of that, probably 80% of that, maybe 90% of that, was um, that uh, English, reading, and math are in flux. And what that means is that as we eliminate these remedial classes, where we used to get a lot of full-time equivalent students and we're doing away with it because everybody's doing away with it, uh, all of a sudden it looks like we're not doing things when in fact what we're doing is what we're expected to do and what we need to do, uh, but the unintended consequences of that, but the actual consequences of that are that our FTSs go down. And uh, that's particularly true at, for reading mm -hmm. because we have a very robust reading program. And as reading is eliminated, I think I heard recently that there are only 21 community college districts in California that still have reading programs, and ours is one of the most robust, and as we eliminate those programs, we lose FTES. So uh, everything's got a story, and it's important to tell the whole story when we look at these things. Anyone else? Thank you, Heather. Um, Dr. Van Volkenberg, uh, item 4.2, enrollment management, recruitment, and retention efforts in 2018 at LBCC. Dr. Mike Nunez, uh, Vice President of Student Support Services. Dr. Kathy Scott, Vice President of Academic Affairs. Dr. Heather Van Volkenberg, Dean of Institutional Effectiveness. Dr. Matt Lawrence, Philosophy Professor, Student Equity Coordinator. Joshua Castellanos, uh, Executive Director of Public Affairs and Marketing, and Marcia Parker, Senior Director of Community Relations and Academic Partnerships, will present on recruitment and retention efforts in 2018 at LBCC. Um, I understand this is a 150-page presentation, <laughs> so uh, I, I thank you in advance for um, attempting to stick to a 25-minute timeline, and I just ask uh, my colleagues to reserve their questions till the end until um, staff is completed with their presentation. Go ahead, team. Awesome. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present. Um, I think we you did a great job with introduction, so I think we'll just go right into the meat, bread, and butter. As you said, there's a lot of slides. We're gonna go quickly in the interest of time. There's been a lot of information provided, but we do wanna be respectful of people's time. So as we've already noted, um, our FTS is declining. What I've showed you here on the right side is a chart of our FTS where we take the summer allocation practices that we've had 
in the past to actually see, and we can see a steady decline in our FTEs. When we start breaking that out to understand why, we can look at that by our primary term FDES, and we see the black bars as our spring term. It is steadily in decline. And what you'll notice is that our fall T FTES each year kind of rebounds back from that decline, and yet we still continue to lose in the spring. Um, our non-primary terms, winter and summer, just continue to grow pretty much, which is great. As we continue to look more into the details about why we're, you know, what's happening here, we can see that our head count is decreasing in the spring, and we're also seeing the students that do come back are taking fewer courses. So that combination will drive down our FTEs. We look at our fall to fall persistence rates, and we can see that students who persist in the spring and in the summer are much more likely to come back in the fall. And we also can look at our fall to spring persistence and we can see that students who take winter classes are much more likely, in the 90%, much more likely to come back in the spring than the students who do not. When we start looking at impacts on different student groups, we found that this impacted everyone. New and continuing students are impacted, whether a student is engaging in a CTE or a liberal arts program, whether they are degree or certificate seeking. It happened despite racial and ethnic backgrounds. It happened despite gender identification. This is affecting all of our students. So we had to look at reasons why. And so one is because there are lower unemployment rates in Long Beach. And so earlier this month, the mayor said, we're at the lowest unemployment rate in 10 years. You can look at the graph on the right. That's our Long Beach unemployment rate. And then over that is our fall to spring persistence rate. They almost lay right on top of each other. Um, we also know that the LBUSD enrollments are declining. They have been declining and will continue probably about 2% in decline annually. We know that in the last academic year, LBUSD students consisted of over a third of our new matriculants. So that's going to continue to be in decline. We also know that LBUSD has done a wonderful job at preparing students to go straight into the four-year track. And so you can see that graph on the right. The percent of students who are ready for that four-year track is just increasing. So how are we going to address this problem? We have three major strategies, and we're going to talk all about the details under these strategies, but they include one, improving and streamlining our existing systems to be student-centered and efficient. Two, diversify and improve our recruitment efforts, our program offerings, and our support services. And then finally, plan and create for future demand. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in regards to enrollment conversions, and I'd like to kind of begin with highlighting and illuminating what we're seeing as a problem. So if you look at the graphs in front of you, both for fall 17 and fall 18, and we look at the students who submit an application, and then we follow those students through the matriculation steps that are required for them to be successfully um, prepared to enroll here at LBCC, what we see is roughly only, four, and for fall 17, roughly only 4% of the students enrolled um, who completed all the matriculation steps. That's a relatively very low percentage. Um, even though there was a slight increase, if we go to fall 18, you can see we were able to put in some interventions and we increased that from 4% to 9%, but we're still not satisfied with that number. And then when you look at the overall enrollment conversion just from students who've applied, regardless of how many matriculation steps they completed, um, those that actually converted into enrollment were hovering at about 20% back in fall 18. So the question is when you look at this kind of data, you always have to ask yourself, the data is important to illuminate the problem, but more importantly, what do you do with the data? What do we do differently? What do we do about it? And so this year, we developed what you see in front of you is the newly developed matriculation con conversion report. This is a report that I get on a weekly basis that comes to my email box that looks at the number of students that have applied and then compares them to the number of students that enrolled. So we're constantly monitoring this number. It's a number that's presented weekly at Cabinet to President Romali and the rest of the administrative executive team. And so what we did is we started implementing some new interventions. The first thing we did is we're increasing our support at our high schools. And so we've hired some outreach recruitment specialists that are placed at the high schools on a weekly basis to help students through these steps. Another um, new intervention we put in place is we're relocating matriculation staff to the Welcome Center. So we have been promoting our Welcome Center as a one-stop so students who need that additional support to get through these matriculation steps, they can arrive and get that support. We've also redesigned the Get Started webpage. Um, when I first onboarded to the college in my role, Dr. Romali said, hey, we have to do something about making the application process easier. 
So I did an analysis. It takes, um, the old website was five clicks to get to the, and they weren't intuitive clicks. There were five clicks that you had to go fishing to find out how to apply to LBCC. We reduced that working with Josh and his team to two very intuitive clicks, and we saw that pay off. The other thing we've been looking at is revising our whole process to, mem to minimize barriers for students, so taking away some of those holds that prevent students from registering. And then lastly, we're streamlining our assessment process with AB705 that allows students to do the self-guided placement tool. Um, so when we look at our current data, you can see for the number of applicants, we're actually down the number of applicants for spring, but we're converting more students into enrollment. So we're actually up over 300 students in enrollment for this particular term compared to the last spring of 2018, despite being down in application. So right now, just with some of these efforts, we went from a 20% conversion rate for renter in spring 2018 up to a 28%. So that's an 8% increase just in, um, by implementing some of these strategies. The next kind of problem that we want to illuminate that we're trying to really focus on and tackle is around our, re around our persistence and our retention. So as you know, we've had the Promise Pathways program for several years. And as we started to really drill down and look at the data, we really saw that the most benefits that were associated with the Promise Pathway were through the onboarding experience of our students. And we weren't seeing some of those longer term outcome data points that we would want to see or expect with our program. And so the problem essentially is that we've increased placement and in success in transfer level math and English, yet it did not yield significant differences in persistence, degree completions, or transfer rates when you compare Promise Pathway students to other similarly like group of students. And so with that, what we've decided to do is through our shared governance process, we work through our Promise Pathways Committee, which is a subgroup of the Student Success Committee, to really kind of think about how we want to re-envision our Promise Pathways program. And so we're rebranding our Promise Pathways program to be known as the Viking Advantage. And part of Viking Advantage will be not only those um, high impact onboarding experiences that we saw in the Promise Pathways, but adding in a first year and second year experience. And so some of those components that we're going to be implementing this summer is the Viking Summer Voyage, which essentially would be like a comprehensive summer bridge. It's two weeks. We're aiming at serving about 750 students in our inaugural Summer Viking Voyage with intensive math um, skill development, counseling and career exploration, and student life and um, community building and team, team building activities. We're also looking at implementing a Viking Welcome Day, which is an extended orientation orientation. We know that not every student can commit to two weeks of a summer bridge. And so what we wanted to do is have a one day, four hour extended orientation that these students can, these new first time in college students can attend and get some intentional um, skill development around how to navigate the campus and be successful here at LBCC. We're also looking at using a case management approach by building student success teams and using our Starfish Early Alert cohorts so that our first year students are case managed and that there's a counselor that's able to intervene when a student gets off path. We're also exploring a first year seminar program, which will be essentially a class that students can enroll in that would really help them understand what it takes and means to be a college student. And lastly, we will continue on with implementing priority registration and building out a full second year experience program. Another key facet that we're looking at in terms of our retention and, and persistence of our students is the use of Starfish Early Alert as our early alert system. So what we know as kind of the problem is that many of our students need that just-in-time intervention and support when they begin to struggle in their courses. To your point, sir, regarding course success, what are we doing about course success? And so our goals for, for fall 2018, when we really think about how we take Starfish to scale, we set a goal for ourselves about 25% of our full-time faculty using Starfish. We wanted to see about 30% of our students receive a kudo or an alert and hopefully engage our students within at least three service areas. So we far surpassed those goals. If you can see for fall 18, our first semester of implementation at scale, at the direction of Dr. Ramali, we went to full scale with fall. We saw 48% of our full-time faculty use the tool. That's phenomenal. I can tell you my previous institution, um, when we went to scale, we, only, we had less than 20% of our faculty use it. So to be at 48%, that's a phenomenal number. Um, so it's a kudos to our faculty. 56% of our students received a kudo or early alert, and we engaged seven service areas through the program. Counseling, athletics, DSPS, library, reading and writing center, transfer center, honors programs, and the dean's list. So what are we looking forward towards in spring 2019? Well, first, we're going to be working with institutional effectiveness to measure the impact. So now that we actually have fall grades in, we can go back and look at the students who 
received a starfish intervention and compare them to students who did not and see what their performance looked like and, and their persistence and course success. Um, matriculation is using this feedback to develop improved workflows. The 50% of students um, getting starfish definitely creates an impact on the service providers. So we're looking at how to improve that as well. So with that said, I'll turn it over to back to Heather. So this slide should actually talk about using better data for scheduling. And so just very quickly, quickly what we're looking at here. This was a um, scatter plot that we provided as part of the program planning process to faculty and department heads and deans. So this was something new that we were rolling out and piloting a new program planning process. So everyone got to engage with this at the department level as well. But basically what we see when we look at it at the institution level is that a big problem is the majority of our highly enrolled courses are in high demand but they're not being supplied to meet that demand. That's what we're seeing here. And so the goal really is to have optimal scheduling that will have courses that are full, but meet student scheduling and program needs. That heat map at the bottom right is showing, those red boxes are showing a meeting pattern where there's a high capacity of denials, a high level of capacity denial. So students are trying to get in at that meeting time and can't. So using this data, people can start working better scheduling and focusing on that. And Kathy's actually going to talk a lot more about that as well. Good evening. Um, we have provided an additional folder for each of the board members that contains some, some information on enrollment management we wanted you to have. It's got a copy of our recent student scheduling survey, a guided pathways roadmap for our administration of justice program, and some current information and challenges on our ADTs, and a copy of our year two priorities for enrollment management. Um, the heat map, ha map that Heather spoke about has been shared with our departments and it's been used in the planning process the, this year in school plans and department plans. And this slide here shows um, another data source. Our goal is to provide a schedule that meets the needs of students while also being mindful of the budget and using our resources as wisely as possible. This chart shows just one way we are monitoring the schedule. If you look at the far right, it gives you our fill rate. And our goal is to have an overall fill rate of 85% and to use prior fill rate data from prior semesters and current fill rate data to build and monitor our schedules. We do our best not to cancel classes, particularly if they're capstone classes, and we're cognizant that we have two campuses, we have day and evening, and we try to cover as much as we possibly can. Um, we are also looking at developing a guaranteed two-year schedule for our students so they can count on the classes they need being offered. In a collective effort among Academic Affairs, Student Services, and IITS, the registration dates are being moved up starting this semester so that students enroll for the term, the following term, before they leave, rather than having them register during summer when they may not be here or at other off-schedule times. Some of the strategies we are using in connection with these improved dates are ones that were created um, after the cyber incident and were led by Dr. Ramali when we were concerned about our summer registration, as you may recall. Uh, one of those strategies uh, that um, our FA president mentioned was the re-enrollment campaign. Faculty worked across campus to let students know of the new registration dates. We reached out to have faculty help us in the classroom. We set up registration sites with laptops where faculty could bring their classes in to register and for students to have an opportunity to talk to counselors. A, a video was made about these efforts and sent to all faculty to encourage greater participation. And as we continue to improve these practices, we are taking the re-enrollment efforts into the classroom with computers that will be going with our counselors into the classrooms. And that's just the second page of the registration dates. Um, we've also been doing quite a bit of professional development and role in, involved in enrollment management, including attending key professional development conferences. Uh, we attended the Claremont Graduate Academy um, Enrollment Management Conference with faculty members. We thought it was very important to bring the faculty with us. Uh, we learned why we need student-centered scheduling, and from that conference, lead faculty members began leading the effort to create a student-centered schedule for LBCC. We also held an enrollment management retreat for all of our department heads last summer based on what we had learned in, at Claremont and had our faculty as well as an as a, um, outside presenter join us. Um, another group of us attended a one-year training on strategic enrollment management. The last conference of that was held in Sacramento last week, but we have coaches and been working very, very diligently for a year on this. Um, one of the outputs from that SEM, Strategic Enrollment Management um, Project, were the goals that you see in the black line at the top. And this effort was really led by Michelle Grimes-Hillman, and I have to give her credit for this. 
Um, but the four, um, the four goals here are to increase room and seat utilization by 10 percent, com complete course rotation plans, um, to complete a business process review of scheduling practices and procedures, and to complete the student-centered schedule. Um, and also, we made a commitment at that time to, to create a guaranteed schedule for students. Um, I won't read all this uh, due to time, and I've said many of these things already, but we do have some new, other new things. For example, we have uh, 25 Live, which is a new program where we can enter all of our uh, space needs, and we can do a better job of allocating space and sharing space. Um, we've also established in that last bullet FTES targets and an FTF calculator, which is essentially the budget component for tracking efficiency and making sure that we stay within budget. And again, I won't read all of these because I've, I've read some of them, but the bottom line here is we are committed to the, the goal of implementing student-centered scheduling in fall of 2020. So uh, Trustee Otto has already said it, course success rates are instrumental in helping students persist. So here's another dashboard that we've created and distributed across the campus. It was presented at College Day in August and has also been used in program planning by faculty. Um, and it basically it is showing the course success rates aggregated over four years. Uh, larger bubbles show larger enrollments. Green bubbles show higher success rates. You can see our, in, our college average is at 64%, which is lower than the state average. Um, Kathy's going to talk more about some of those results. We have been talking about course success rates quite extensively over the last year. And we, do, we have seen, with one year of data, some improvements. Uh, for example, one department saw an increase of nearly 10% in course success. In another area, 219 faculty saw an increase of greater than 5%. And in another area, 106 courses, there was an increase of greater than 10%. Um, this, is a, this course success rate is really critical to so many things, including our students and their financial aid status. Um, as you may recall, Janae Hund at College Day talked about this and talked about how she had looked at her course success data and changed her entire way of teaching, except the content. Um, she, she just changed the way that she interacted with students, and that is something that we're going to hear about now from, um, actually, maybe not. Yeah, 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 no, we are. And so again, it's not just about looking at course success rates, but also the importance of equity. So when we look, our course success rates are inequitable, and we can see that data there on the right-hand side where it is inequitable. Um, Dr. Matt Lawrence. Want me to introduce him? Yeah, okay. He's going to talk a little more about work that he has done in relation to improving those pipelines. Good evening, everyone. I am both honored and excited to be your new student equity coordinator. And I've got something a little more personal to share this evening. I'm going to be talking about seeing my student equity data and the effect that it had on me. I'm a, a big advocate of the direction the college is moving at getting our um, course level student equity disaggregated data to every faculty member um, as soon as possible. For me, it was a big wake up call. I'd always been a very successful uh, teacher. I've got, I was one of the few faculty to see my disaggregated data about two and a half years ago. And while all racial groups in my classes were performing higher than the college averages, I found that my African American success rate was about 58%. My white success rate was about 89%. When I started to view that through an equity lens, I realized, wow, I've got a 31% gap here that that just will not do. So over the past two and a half years, I made it a priority to try and reduce the success, the success gap for my African-American students. I've done a lot of research and strategizing on equity methods and have, have eventually led, led to both a shift in consciousness and a, fit, a shift in concrete strategies and what I'm doing in my courses. To speak to that consciousness shift, I'd say the main thing is it, it moved me out of what I think is, is sort of a norm for professors, and we got it from our professors. My focus was always on giving a great course. And my students said, oh, that's a great course. And I felt like I was, I was doing great, and most students were succeeding. But now I put much more focus 
on my role book and grade book and pay much more attention to each individual students, especially those students that are most likely to not fulfill their goal in the course. And, you know, we, as we've seen, the numbers are our African-American success rates are, are lower. And so I, I've been keeping an eye on my African-American students, working with them. That brings my attention to other students as well. Over these last two years, I've really increased my contact with students uh, through email, early alerts, and kudos. I've increased my student office hours by about five times. And last, last semester, I had over 63 individual students coming in, and some of them coming multiple times. Uh, increased awareness of who is and who is not engaged and participating in classes. And I've changed concrete strategies been totally reworking my syllabus for years, making it more welcoming and engaging. I've been changing my curriculum to make it more representative, more diverse, but also more relevant and empowering, really thinking about and paying attention to what my students of color need to speak out in class, to feel engaged with the material, excited. Been more flexible when students face hardships. I've moved to more lower weight assignments, say Five major exams as opposed to three, and each one counting a little less has been, been beneficial to the students. And also just changing the classroom environment, changing the direct, the, the desk arrangements for more collaborative learning. So that's just the tip of the iceberg of some of the things I've been doing. I wanted to quickly show you some of the results. Uh, cumulative success rates over the past two years uh, African American success rate now up to 78%, just three point gap from the white students with an overall success rate at 77%. And in the, over these two years, no racial group was below about three points from the uh, overall success rate. Uh, but I'm especially excited about last semester when I was, I was really trying to be intentional about this. And I was able to completely close the gap last semester. My African-American success rate at 86% right along the white um, at 86%. And a further increase in overall um, success for the course at 81%. So it's, um, you know... Course success is kind of emerging as a little theme here this evening. Uh, as student equity coordinator, it is going to be a, an issue very close to my heart. We're going to be working on a lot of trainings with faculty to increase course level success. And I just wanted to end by saying our, our African American students, the more we build relationships with them, we see that they often face particular challenges and institutional obstacles to their success. I, I was surprised and excited to see one of my outstanding honor students here tonight, Mario Gross there. He was hoping to actually speak to that issue tonight, and I found out, oh, he didn't fill out a comment card. So I don't know if it's in your purview to let him speak at the public comment, but he, he's got some, some ideas on that theme that he's concerned about. Thanks. Yeah, and we're, I'm happy to let him speak after you guys and after the questions. Uh, the efforts described by Dr. Lawrence will be highlighted in this year's Faculty Flex Day, which is March 21st, 2019. The photo here shows one of the breakout sessions from last year, and we get very good attendance at this event. Um, as we did last year, uh, faculty professional development led by Jerry Florence, who's here. I saw her here tonight, if you have any questions. Uh, partnered with Student Equity, as they will be doing again this year. We will work, be working specifically on improving core success rates for African American students, Latinx, and Pacific Islanders through the workshops that are listed here. Um, and it was nice to hear um, our FA president, uh, Kirsten Moreno, mention the equitized syllabus. That is certainly one of them. Um, and the professional development in, in, increased levels will, be, will continue year-round with workshops on continuing to review course success data. We'll be doing online training, both in regards to um, e uh, equity gaps as well, and uh, additional data workshops. And have a community of practice uh, philosophy, which is really a collaborative learning among the faculty. And we're, with our new schedule, we will be having a college hour, and there'll be time for faculty to get together and to talk about these strategies. Um, another area in which we are growing is our online enrollment. Um, and it's an area where, again, we need to pay attention to the equity numbers. But um, it's been growing substantially, and it's been helping us. Uh, we had a 15% increase in online enrollment in the year 
in the, in the last year, an 11% increase in online courses and a 16% increase in online sections. Uh, another important way in which we are impacting students is with our OER, or Open Educational Resources, also known as free online textbooks. In some cases, these texts already exist. In other cases, they need to be created. Our Learning and Academic Resources, uh, also called LAR, faculty created a Learn 11 textbook for a course that has about 40 sections a year. They created this text with funding from an equity mini-grant, and as you can see in red, there will be an annual savings to students of about $88,000, and that's one... 1,100 students not having to pay $80 for a textbook. Um, the success rate hasn't changed because we haven't yet implemented the book, but it will be changing, I, I feel confident. This is some more um, up-to-date data that we've been sharing out. Uh, this is, again, another set of dashboards that was provided through the program planning process as well. What we're seeing in the top right is the numbers of declared students majors by program. What I've highlighted for you is the business major, business administration, ADT. So you can see it's 1,564 students. Then when we look a few years later, so that's from the year 2014-15, when we look um, at the year 17-18, there are 281 actual completions. And so again, what we're seeing is there's a disconnect there between the students who are coming in and then the students who are actually getting through and completing. And so again, we're using this data to help inform strategies to, to increase student success. Uh, additionally, we, can also, we also provide in this dashboard programs with no completions. Just an FYI, 10% of this on the list are actually new programs, so they wouldn't have completions. Another 45% of those listed are actually going through processes of change, review, or becoming inactivated. And so again, we're really working to make sure that our programs are supporting student needs. So again, just a brief overview of AB 705 and what we're doing to implement the legislation. Um, as you know, AB 705 was si signed into law in October of 2017, which required colleges to use one or more of the following for placements for students into courses in math and English. And that's the use of high school coursework, GPA, and high school grades. Um, in complying with AB 705, our college is fully implemented. Um, guided self-placement through our assessment center, as well as we are using high school transcript data through our partnership with LBUSD to place students. And Dr. Scott will speak more specifically about English and math. Thank you. Um, under AB 705, uh, students will be placed directly into college-level math and English with additional supports, embedded tutoring, currently funded by equity, and co-requisite support, support courses. English faculty and math faculty have done a great deal of work on curriculum and pedagogy. Um, English will be co uh, piloting their co-rec course this spring, which is ahead of the required uh, fall 19 date. And similarly, math has already started placing students higher, which has affected our FTES, and um, also embedded tutoring and um, new pedagogical uh, strategies. Uh, ESL has three years uh, for students to go through their sequence, and they are already compliant with AB 705, but they are working very hard, as the other areas are, on improving their um, courses and streamlining the sequence as much as possible. Um, as noted by um, Trustee Otto, um, there's, there, while there still is a, reading, a demand for reading, those courses are declining in, in need, um, mostly because the associate degrees for transfer don't require reading. And we also wanted to mention quickly our guided pathways. There's been a large effort to implement them. Um, as you can see here in the photo, uh, Kenna Hillman, who is um, overseeing this effort, uh, talked to our high school counselors on earlier in January about our guided pathways. We are creating roadmaps and plans for all of our programs. And if students haven't decided which plan is right for them, they can choose a meta major, which will get them started in the right direction. And you can see on this slide our beautiful new um, logo for Guided Pathways to kind of go along with the Viking theme. And we have in included all constituency groups. We've got Jumpstart New Roadmap workshops and webinars, and we've been very, very involved. Um, guided Pathways, uh, this goes to show all of the work we've done to make sure that we're communicating with all of our committees and our constituency groups. And it shows the efforts that will continue in spring to make sure that this work is completed. So here we have some more data showing our transfers by unit load, and we can see we're remaining about stable for the transfers to CSU, so that's opportunity for growth and improvement. We have seen some growth in our transfers to UCs, and so that's excellent, and so we want to see that continuing to grow. And as you know from previous presentations, our ADTs are up 26% from last year. Okay. Anything? Okay. 
Um, yes, I also wanted to add that uh, we're adding new ADTs as much as we can. Um, the new social justice ADT will be on board, we hope. Um, it will be go through a curriculum in spring and will have its first of a kind course here at LBCC on LGBTQ studies. Um, we're also doing the hospitality ADT. And uh, just a couple other things. Business has increased their ADT completions by 21%, Calm by 14%, and Psych by 37%, and that's an increase just in one year. Okay, so we've talked about one, now we're going to go right into two. You can read it, so I won't say it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how is the public affairs and marketing team addressing uh, recruitment? As Heather mentioned, that we're being affected by factors like the low unemployment, uh, LBUSD, our major feeder school, having less students, and most of them now, or a lot more of them, going to CSU. So what do we need to do about it? We need to reach more people. We need to communicate our, our messages much more effectively, improve our relationships both on and off the campuses, and use data to measure our efforts. Over the past year, we've worked really hard to leverage the technology and resources that we have, um, but we also haven't forgotten about that face-to-face -face and the handshake. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share what the communication has done, some of the beautiful work that the communication has put together, and then Marcia will kind of go over some of the, the hard work that the outreach team is going. I mean, she was literally ankle deep in the rain last week at Huntington Beach. So um, before I start, trustees, there's a, a, a pamphlet there in front of you. There's a, a black folder that has most of the materials that uh, our team has kind of created over the years. So I'm going to flip through this pretty quickly, but if you want, you can go back to reference that. Um, one of the first things that we want to do is we want to kind of celebrate some of our successes, and, and our summer campaign was one of those. That was a full campaign, and just some of the things that we did, we, we had print ads all over the place, we had social media, we had lawn signs, we added pop-up canopies on the campuses to hand out flyers. Uh, the semester before, we had the drop-in registration labs, which ended up being a huge success um, with the, all the involvement, and we added for some phone banks. And as, as you just kind of, I'm going to start flipping through these pretty quickly, but just, just take notice of, of how, how beautiful. We're very lucky that we hired Marinda uh, Martin, our new graphic designer, and everything that she does is just, it's beautiful. She, she, she focuses on, on the messaging. And these are everywhere. They're on social media. They're on, on clings. They're on banners. I mean, you, you, if you picked up any newspaper anywhere, you're going to see these. Mm -hmm. um, this was a beautiful uh, a campaign that we ran on social media. If you look, these are 10, 10 different reasons why you should uh, take summer classes. And we reached 91,000 people with this campaign. Um, and again, we really wanted to focus on those drop-in registrations. So some of these are some of the, full, the, the banners and the posters that we posted around campus. Really, really beautiful. Um, our fall campaign, if you start to notice our, camp, our, our, our semester campaigns have a theme to them. And this was one of our, our, our really dynamic themes. And this was an inspiration by Dr. Amali and saying, hey, you, you know, take people that are trending right now. So Kylie Jenner, thank you very much. This is some of the colors from, from her, some of her new products. Um, we really are really focusing on uh, being compelling. Um, and one of the things that we really focused on is making sure that we're reaching everybody. Uh, we want to reach as many people as possible. Not everybody is on social media. Not everybody is, you know, on a website. So uh, if you're anywhere in the area, if you look at any publication, we are now on most of those publications and on the front page. Um, in fact, one of the publications I used to publish, which is Lakewood Community News, we make sure that we're in there all the time. And Emily, you can see we're on the, the, the cover of the press telegram as well. Um, just some stats here. Our total circulation, we're almost at 5 million uh, circulation uh, over the past year. So we just want to make sure that you know we are in front of you and that we're making an impact. Um, again, we're, we're focusing on, on really dynamic pieces. This was a, a campaign with a starfish that Dr. Munoz has talked about, 40, 48 percent um, uh, faculty buy-in, and this was there was targeted pieces for faculty, for staff, and for the students, and all this was designed in-house, so that's something we're really proud of, including the video that we played at College Day. Um, it, it, I'm just going to flip these pretty quickly, but you just take a look at how beautiful these pieces are. I mean, these are just absolutely beautiful. This is something that, I, you know, I've been around this a long time, and I'm just really proud of. Um, the social media, we are, have really increased our social media, uh, our reach and engagement. Just look on Facebook. We've reached five, we increased 544% of our engagements on, on Facebook. 
Twitter, we have increases all across the board. Instagram, if you guys remember about this year last time, I, I tweeted to uh, Brian Brayman while he was at playing the Super Bowl, and he actually responded to that, to that post, and luckily we were able to get him back on campus. So uh, we're really trying to take advantage of our social media, and we've almost increased it uh, 90, 92%. <laughs> Um, we've really worked hard on putting a lot of press, uh, press releases out there and, and advisories. Um, the College Promise 2.0, just alone, we were on Channel 4, Channel 5, we were on KFI, KNX, and that was a, a huge, a huge uh, deal for us. Uh, the website, you know, has went through a re redesign, and we have nearly 16,000, you know, over 16, 16 million uh, page views, uh, a huge increase there, too. Uh, we're really working on the SEO on the, on the web page, too. And as Mike said, that we, we did rearrange the, the CCC Apply button now. And if you see, there's a lot of people that actually clicked that button, 133,000. And you see 45,000 people actually completed the application. But now that we have data that we can actually use and measure, that tells us that a lot of people click it, but a lot more are not completing. So we're actually creating a video that should be put up in a few days that's going to be on the page that's going to encourage people to actually finish that application and give them some, some tips on how to do it. Um, and you, the communication and outreach to teams have just been huge as part of all the, the events. And I'm just going to flip these pretty quickly. But College Day uh, was a huge success. Um, the 2.0 press event. Um, the Social Science Night, um, thanks to Janae for including us in this. And, the, for the very first time ever, they had that, and they had over 400 people attend that. And I can tell it was a success because they ran out of pizzas in like 20 minutes. So that was a big deal. All right, um, students in need, um, the Port of Long Beach, who are our, our, our great new partners. Oh, we were so thankful for, for their involvement, um, Long Beach Veterans Day Parade. So there's just a lot that, that, that we've been a part of. And some of the new things that we're working on, we actually added a Snapchat filter to commencement days, and we had 51,000 views on that Snapchat filter. This is something that's really exciting. It's coming soon. You guys are going to start to see it, but it's Campus Bird. It's our new mapping system for the entire campus, and you guys are going to be blown away by this when we present that soon. And of course, the new Viking logo that Marinda Martin designed. Thank you, Randy Tutor, for bringing this to us and, uh, and, and trusting us with designing this thing. And you can see some of the progress. It was actually from a sketch, and it was very intentional. We're really happy with that. And of course, the Campus Community News, we're really proud of that. And now this gets mailed to all the influencers, and thanks to uh, Dr. Munoz um, and their team for bringing all those counselors because we just added all of those to the list of people that will be getting it. So uh, we're really excited for it. We're just trying to communicate as much as possible. Uh, we started this weekly breakdown, which shares all the events that are happening uh, for the week to all the students, that are, and that's getting put on all the social media pages. So that's, uh, that's it for my presentation. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Marcia Parker, our dynamic <laughs> director of outreach. Thank you, Josh, and uh, we're almost done. So hello, everyone. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk about some of the things we're doing in outreach. Uh, this is a list of um, some of the ways that we, through over the last year, were able to diversify our recruitment efforts. So first and foremost, our academic partnerships. This is really going to help us in um, having a broader reach to our prospective student audience. So for example, we've, we've been partnering with ABC Unified, Paramount, Linwood, um, and as was mentioned, we have a lot of uh, community center for community partnership uh, events coming up. Recruitment, we wanted to make sure, and uh, in addition to our high school-based recruitment, really make sure we're reaching out to our general community. And so uh, we went from 38 uh, community-based events to 62 community-based events last year, and we also created a working group focused on identifying and staffing recruitment events related to diversity and inclusion. And so this is just a list of some of the uh, events that we have attended, both high school recruitment booths and meetings. So not only within our district, but also beyond. Uh, Huntington Beach, Sato, Linwood, Cams, Cabrillo, Milliken, um, Beach High School, uh, McBride, Wilson, Artesia. This is actually a list of different events that we um, participated in in the community. So we did go to uh, Pomona and, and help the uh, culinary staff and, and their team um, with the Pro Cup event. And the, the signs you saw in the hallway are actually from that. We were um, we did a 5K. We were at Lakewood Concert in the Park every Thursday evening from June through August. 
We um, had the pleasure of exhibiting at the Long Beach Jazz Festival over a three-day period. We were at the Stepping in the Right Direction College Fair very recently. Another big thing that we focus on is our tours. And so last year we provided tours to over 2,000 students and we provided tours to over um, 5,000 fourth graders as part of the Long Beach College Promise. And then we also have uh, some really nice, uh, what we call our partnership tours as well. And so these are some of the groups that actually normally will, will call us and request a tour. So we'll have different groups anywhere from 50 to um, 80 students at a time. And so these are just some of the different school groups that have um, done a tour with us. We also do tours for individuals and families. So for example, in summer 2018, we had uh, 78 individuals and families come and tour. We work with our matriculation team uh, on their Saturday early bird events to provide tours to students to help them get acclimated to campus. We also collaborate with a number of different departments. So for example, we provide tours to our uh, prospective, prospective athletes. Um, we had a cameo mentoring program tour, uh, working with our international students. And then we had some really lovely partnership tours with ABC Unified, Councilwoman Mongo, Linwood, USC Advising Corps, and Paramount Unified. We also provide tours for our internal audience, so Human Resources, our Deaf and Hard of Hearing uh, Student Club, Counseling One, um, our Dual Enrollment Program, our International Student Program. And then uh, another thing that we really realize is that we need to reinvest in our current students. And so as has been mentioned, we uh, have done a lot of things to really try to re-enroll our current student population in terms of pop-up uh, canopies. We called over 4,000 students and then we also collaborated with over 170 faculty and staff. And so these are some of the different um, uh, pop-up tents that we hosted across campus. We held signature events, our inaugural Health Professions Career Exposure Summit, and we assisted with business at the beach. And then uh, finally, uh, we really wanted to concentrate on brand awareness and community building. So we're really excited that a team of us will be going very soon to present for the Bellwether competition. Uh, we contributed to a Psychology Today uh, article. We provided our lovely uh, signature LDCC mailer to over 230,000 homes. And we've also been doing things in the, the general community uh, in terms of service. So this is a picture from um, where uh, Dr. Amali and, and a number of us went and prepared meals for uh, families at the Ronald McDonald House. And that was one of the most rewarding things that I've ever done. And I'm really thankful we, we were able to do uh, that activity. And so our next steps, we do have an enhanced perspective student tracking system that's going to help us um, really know which events are um, the most productive for LBCC. We had a lovely partnership breakfast the other day. So this is a picture with um, our ABC Unified uh, partners from that breakfast. We're going to be hosting a signature event in each trustee district. And we're really excited about expanding our Promise 2.0 Center for Community Partnerships program. Thank you. And we'll pass through this slide because we know that you know what we're doing. Okay. Um, as you know from recent board meetings, we're working very hard to modify and create new cur curriculum to meet workforce needs. We have re redesigned the trades program, as you saw two meetings ago. And we are also a member of the Regional Maritime Center for Excellence. And we'll be going to San Diego next week. Um, with the strong workforce projects, um, we've been able to fund these programs. And I would like to take a moment to tell you what happened last week in regards to uh, these regional projects. Uh, two of the programs that were most important to LBCC, the Global Trade and Logistics, the second bullet there, and the fourth bullet, Energy Construction Utilities, were not fully funded by the LAOC Regional Consortia, despite our staff's best, best efforts. Um, last Friday, Dr. Romali and I attended the President's meeting where the final vote on these projects was taken. Dr. Romali was the most prepared president in the room and fought for a half an hour for those programs with no support from any of the other college presidents. Um, she was gracious but firm in the end and was the only dissenting vote. But we left there thinking we had lost those, the funding for those programs and it was rather upsetting. Um, she got a text last night at 10.05, not that we're counting the exact time, um, <laughs> saying that even though it was late, they wanted her to know that the other presidents had relooked at those programs and reconsidered their position and their vote. Those two programs have now been fully funded. Oh my God. So. 
Um, and I would like to take just a second to talk about that last one, business engagement. That will provide funding for us to create positions to, to support internships for our students and also a job placement coordinator. Um, uh, in terms of our dual enrollment, um, this is another area that we're growing. Um, I think, as you know, we're offering classes on two LBUSD uh, high school campuses, Jordan and Cabrillo, this spring. And while our program is still small, there has been an increase in course offerings of 10.1% and an increase in enrollment of 49% in the last year. Um, it's very pathway focused, and we've also had discussions with LBUSD about an early college at Browning High School. Um, here are some photos from Browning. They, um, their kitchens look a lot like our kitchens, which was no surprise and no accident. Um, they opened two years ago, um, but we're looking at uh, starting with dual enrollment, offering classes in the culinary program after school at their campus, and we hope to move towards an early college model, model where students would receive either a certificate or an associate's degree, and we perhaps uh, are the one in hospitality, the ADT in hospitality, along with our high school diploma. That is our goal. Um, we've also had a significant increase in our non-credit program, and while it's still small, you can see how much it's grown, up to 65 courses uh, for this year, programs from 3 to 17, off-site off locations have also grown. Um, some of these courses include auto, construction, forklift operation, computer office, citizenship, and ESL. And we're looking to also create services, new services for our non-credit students, including an A&R process and counseling. Um, our non-credit offerings and potential offerings are held, or we hope to be held, at these sites. We currently have classes at Centro Cha, YMCA, and we're looking at some other sites, um, including elementary schools, where we uh, have our students, um, are, they, they are parents of students that they have dropped off there earlier that day. And uh, these are our adult ed community partners. I won't read them, but we meet with them regularly in relation to our adult ed uh, grant. And um, we have a meeting this Friday, and they are very important partners to us in this effort. And uh, finally, we have our adult ed has a summer bridge program where we work with students who don't often consider themselves college going. Um, we help to acclimate them to college, take away that fear factor. Um, they practice their basic skills. They get to um, learn about our programs, and they also get priority registration. And we hope to continue that program this summer and to grow that as well. And finally, we've crossed everything off. Um, I don't know how long it's taken. I don't want to know. Um, but our enrollment is down a little bit. But LBC is up and taking action the way only a Viking can. And thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, all of you. I have to tell you, I'm impressed. Uh, I couldn't keep up with, uh, with you guys going through, flipping through the pages. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> not disappointing. I, um, before I take uh, questions from trustees, I wanted to also give Matt, your honor student, Mario, an opportunity to speak. I'm going to take um, chair privileges to give you the opportunity. We'll um, look the other way about the comment card. <laughs> President Romali, board members, I want to thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. I feel honored. However, I'm just a simple man. I'm just a simple man. Um, I don't, uh, I am also disabled uh, due to a brain injury and I'm also African American. I have so many things against me. So if in some way I sound a little bit confusing, I'm sorry, I'm gonna try to stick to uh, my message. So, thank you. <laughs> Please bear with me. So this, so when we talk about the experience of improving the experience of African American students like myself, who are also disabled, I'm glad that you're uh, listening to me because it has a lot to do with my ex how we experience education and how um, we are perceived and how uh, the gatekeepers uh, that allow us to come into these institutions treat us, right? So this spring I had a uh, not so fortunate experience. I experienced micro, microaggression. I experienced discrimination. Um, however, uh, I brought this to the attention of my professor. Um, and rather than us being able to sit down uh, within a university that believes in the ideals of like, equality and we communicate these things throughout the data and throughout all of the documents and marketing, we're encouraging the community and African Americans and disabled students to come that, that you believe in me and my potential, right? So I'm an older student, 
And the reason I came so late in life is because many people didn't believe in my potential, and I believe that I was incapable uh, of actually dreaming the American dream as well as executing or actually accomplishing that dream, right? So I come into this institution and I have a gatekeeper within the institution who also communicates to me that I'm incapable of achieving a degree or uh, are capable of obtaining uh, any type of potential or, or forgive me. So when I brought this to the attention of uh, human resources and uh, to the disabled student services, uh, they listened to me. I do want to tell you that they did listen. However, it was very uncomfortable. They didn't know how to really um, take this in as well as how they didn't really want to deal with the aggression or the claims of discrimination. And um, so instead, the professor, I was left in the classroom, the professor retaliated against me, he barred me from class, he actually violated my ADA rights, he re took those away from me, and all out of fear, for no reason. These are the contingencies that students like myself, <laughs> when you talk about whether we, will we succeed or uh, Will we uh, get our degrees? Then we have to look at it's because of our experiences that we fail. The daily, day-to-day -day interactions of how you treat me will determine whether I succeed or not. And so I had some questions that I wanted to ask because I believe I, I read a lot about you, President Mali, and I believe um, in this institution and the ideals of equality <coughs> that you communicate to me as a member of this community. And so I have to ask that in my experience, that when this institution imagines the ideals of equality and inclusion, do you believe in the, that these ideals are attainable? Because unfortunately, we do have people within this institution who believe that this is, these ideals aren't attainable and they operate uh, within this institution uh, from a different perspective. They believe that these are just things are fairy tales, as I was told, you know, that they are unattainable. So when we talk about equality and stuff like that, they're really not attainable. Do you believe in the human potential to live up to these ideals? Do we hold people accountable or, uh, you know, professionals, the gatekeepers accountable for their behavior and how they treat students like myself? Because I can tell you, this is my real experience. And unfortunately, I'm so, Sorry that in the, in, with all of this good news that I have to bring this to you, you know, something so not so good, you know, not so good experience. But I hope that you can help me because still um, we have the English uh, uh, department chair. No one has replied to me. No one has answered my emails. Um, they were hoping that this would go away, which is the African-American experience, that we are something to be pushed aside, that our voices will be silenced through the confusion, right? That they isolated me, that they would not let me uh, discuss these matters with other students who had already, they too had had some of the similar experiences, right? So when we talk about equality, and we talk about improving uh, our, the outcome of those who look like me within my community, right? Then we have to deal with what's in the heart of those who are actually the gatekeepers within this institution, the ones who hold the keys for me to be able to cross the bridge to get to my degree so that I can come out of poverty like you. Oh boy, I have a dream, right? Like you, I have a dream. And hopefully one day I will sit where you are sitting and be able to help someone else like myself attain that dream. But first it starts here. It starts with the experience, with my experience and, and giving this some real attention and discovering and holding those who tried to rob me of my dream, let's hold them accountable. You know, but not in the way of getting rid of them. Let's just have them take a deeper look at the experience and be able to self-assess, you know, because it didn't have to go this far. It just needed to be, it was something that needed to be uh, taken seriously. You know, and it was something that needed to be addressed. So uh, I ask that, uh, I know that you can't answer these questions right now. This is probably bigger than 
what it is, but I, when we talk about equality of outcome among disabled minority students, then we have to address the experience. And we also have to ensure that those who are the gatekeepers of my education understand that it is those everyday interactions that when you see me walk on this campus that you don't hold fear in your heart. I'm not there to hurt you. That when I speak up, that you don't try to silence me and isolate me. Because, you know, the truth hurts, but you know, we, we, can, we can do better, right? So I thank you for listening to me and I hope, uh, I don't know how you address this, <laughs> President Ramal, but I believe to some degree, I hope that you all have heard me and I hope to some degree uh, we can deal with this at a later time. But thank you. Thank you, Mario. I, I want to thank you for expressing your viewpoints um, and for being here, for participating. It is important for us to know what's going on. Um, it's, you know, the administration is, I could tell you from a personal experience, uh, I'm serving my second term, it is night and day. I am so grateful for this incredible leadership. I want to take a moment. It's, hard, it's very, you know, it's important for us to pause and be grateful. And I just want to be expressing this to you, Dr. Romali. I'm very grateful to you, to your leadership, to this dream team. And I am confident, Mario, that they're going to take your perspective, your input into account. And I can assure you that I have, I can vouch for this team that they will look into it. They will follow through. And... We have a, we as a board, and I, if I could take the liberty of speaking on behalf of us, I think this is a shared sentiment that we don't tolerate behavior that is aggressive, that is unacceptable, and you know, I've said this before, uh, this isn't an institution that there's no, it's, we're going to make sure that folks understand that there's no impunity, and we're gonna work on that, we're not perfect, and we're gonna take steps, and I, it's, if we don't know, we, if, if nobody brings it up to us, we don't know, and I really thank you for having the courage to come here at a public board meeting. It says a, lo a lot about you and your character, and um, I personally have to tell you that until I lived in Long Beach, I had no idea, I had no idea about the kind of inequity and the imbalance and inequality that the African American community experiences. And you are teachers for my community. I want you to know that, and you inspire me personally. Thank you. I'd like to give the Board of Trustees um, an opportunity to ask questions, comments, and uh, before I do that, Superintendent President, Dr. Romali, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Mario. Um, you, despite your claims of not being an eloquent speaker, I think you're probably the most eloquent speaker in the room. Um, you may have missed your calling. I think you really have a calling. And this week of all weeks, I heard Dr. King in there, so I hope that uh, you really inspired me and, and you sort of brought him to life again. I really want to thank you for coming forward. You touched my heart. This is not acceptable. But I thank you that in a learning institution, you're giving us an opportunity to learn because that's, it, it's impossible to hate when we understand and you're giving us an opportunity to understand. So I, I want you to do me the favor of leaving me your name and number. You can rest assured that it will be addressed. But you, by coming forward and not allowing, as you said, anyone to rob you, I want to acknowledge your courage. But what you did today, it won't just help you, it can help others. When we find solutions to solve your problem, we're also finding solutions to solve other people's problems. So kudos to you. I know that probably took a tremendous amount of courage, and I just wanted to say thank you. Rest assured, we are very grateful for what you've done today. Board members, thank you, Superintendent President, Dr. Molly. Board members, comments, questions? Uh, Danelle, student trustee Danelle Jones. Thank you. Um, I've got uh, quite a few questions and comments. Uh, I'll try to make them really quick. Uh, but first, um, I want to say thank you, Mario, for uh, having the courage to come and speak up. Because it, as they've said, you speak up not only for yourself, but for others who have shared your experience. 
and your voice really does matter, and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, and to kind of, uh, you know, echo that, I've also experienced a similar um, experience here. However, I, you know, I did take the time and, and meet with uh, Superintendent President Ramali um, and express these, these, uh, the incident to her, and, you know, she assured me that she was going to look into it, and, and, I, and I truly believe that, that she will and that she, she has the passion, you know, for us, you know, for us, you know, as her students to see it through. Um, I also want to let you know that although this experience did happen, you know, my experience so far has, is that this is not, you know, an indication of how Long Beach City College is, you know, as, you know, as, as a whole. Um, the, these incidents, you know, may be few and far between. And yes, they do have, you know, damaging implications, but it's not a representation of what Long Beach City College is about, and that's what I really uh, enjoy about this institution. Um, and then now to speak about the, the presentation that we had here, um, I would like to thank um, my, my faculty um, research advisor, Dr. Matthew Lawrence, for coming in and speaking about um, the differences that he's made in his classroom. Uh, personally, um, I've actually, you know, been on the receiving end of some of these changes. My, my first year, I took a um, ethics class with him, fall 17, and he actually took me aside and, and, and actually gave me an interest in uh, pursuing philosophy and really pursuing social justice. Um, and the changes, the, the, the more relevant coursework, um, I do believe it, it, it helps the students to kind of engage more, especially with, with topics like ethics and, and, and other things that may be the, the traditional coursework may not be so, so um, easy to engage with. Um, and, and I truly believe that that will continue to help, you know, students uh, like myself, like Mario, and, and other students who may not um, traditionally, you know, look at, you know, philosophy or, or the humanities, really be able to engage and succeed and persist in that manner. Um, I also uh, would like to thank um, everybody involved with the Starfish Early Alert System. Um, I, I was a little skeptical at first of how, um, of how uh, relevant or um, efficient it would be or effective it would be, but I, I, I've actually um, have noticed that some of those uh, notifications come across my org when I logged in, and, and you know, normally it says on track, and I got one the other day that said off track, and I was starting to lose my mind a little bit, and I was like, oh, what do I do? Um, you know, but you know, I, I spoke with my counselor, and she assured me that everything's great, and she says, got to make sure that I, that I get my math class in before I transfer. Um, uh, so, kudos for that. I, I think it, it, it's definitely you know going to um, going to really help uh, a student, you know, persistence and success uh, in the overall. Uh, regarding uh, AB 705, um, I know that the way that things are being implemented, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of changes going on. Um, I do have one slight concern that um, that maybe non-traditional age students may be uh, left behind in, in a lot of the changes are not necessarily included there, at least in the way that, that I've heard about it so far. I don't, I, you know, I'm hoping that I'm wrong in that case, but just to get to Thank you so much. <laughs> and then also, um, I did have another quick question regarding um, uh, the way uh, students are being dropped for non-payment still. I know that back in was it June or July, we talked about um, working with a, a third party, uh, Nelnet, to, um, to implement a, like a payment plan that would kind of help students to remain in good standing. Um, my experience so far, and from what I've heard from other students so far, is that uh, the payment plan may not be working as intended, or at least the way it was explained. Um, students are still having a difficulty adding classes, um, and uh, their, their accounts are not necessarily being kept in the good standing, uh, which is prohibiting them from getting access to the transcripts. So maybe if we can look into kind of how that's being implemented or seeing if there's some changes that can be made there, or at least some clarification, I think that would be great. Um, and, and then the last thing regarding um, student-centered scheduling. Um, I know that that has been, you know, kind of a, an issue across the board, not just within Long Beach City College, but across the entire, you know, college uh, scene. Um, and I know that um, one of the big things that, that I almost experienced, but fortunately, you know, there's some flexibility um, within our system is that some vital classes, especially during during uh, intercessions, uh, maybe you know, drop for low enrollment. If there's anything that we can do 
to maybe um, work with that, you know, to allow classes that, that may not have the, the full or even 50% capacity to still somehow launch, um, you know, courses like the second level of languages, foreign language requirements, students that need, to, need these classes to get out of here are having uh, difficulty. Um, uh, if we can do something in, in that department, I think that would, be, that, would be really go, that would really go a long way to improving student success rates and persistence. Uh, and that's all for me. Thank you. Um, a trustee Baxter, is there any response that uh, we want to give any uh, on any of the points that the student trustee has brought up? Uh, okay, trustee Baxter, go ahead. Thank you. Mario, I want to congratulate you. And I used to be in student activities, and you need to run for student government. <laughs> okay, so uh, Dr. Munoz can tell you how to do that, because you, you are obviously a uh, natural-born leader, and, and uh, thank you for bringing those things up. Uh, then I wanted to talk about uh, AB 705. I'm mentoring a student right now who started Long Beach City College in the fall, She's 26 years old, and um, the counselor did what the counselor was supposed to do. Looked at her high school record, which is eight years old, and, and uh, suggested that she take statistics and English 105. She was programmed for failure, being out of school eight years. So we need to look at, that. just like you said, now, not everybody is an 18-year-old. And uh, we need to look at that. And I know, I know it's a law and we got, I don't know how you change those kinds of things, but I think we need to look at it. That, that's number one. Then lastly, um, having been on this uh, college for over 40 years, it's amazing, and, and Mrs. Florence will agree with me, how everything comes around. For instance, we used to have high school counselors, we used to have Lobby City College counselors at every single high school. They were there one day a week. They would answer questions, they would respond and, and take care of the students. You know, during the cutbacks, we got rid of that. Um, we used to have summer orientation where students would come for four hours, they would take the placement test, they got to listen to me talk to them, they had a counseling appointment. And, and, uh, and a tour of the campus. We, we got rid of that. Uh, and then lastly, I, uh, and I'm glad we're bringing all these things back, and then lastly, to bring back the college hour, I think is wonderful. Another thing that we eliminated and now we're looking at. So I think um, we need to look at other things. Those three things come out, came up to me right away that perhaps we need to relook at some, some of the successful things we've done in the past. Other things I know we've eliminated and that's okay. But um, I'm glad to see the, the counselors or, or outreach people at the high schools again. Thank you. Trustees, other trustees? Trustee Intook? Thank you. Um, great presentation, mammoth volume of information. Uh, and we know a lot of time and, and hard work went into it and really want to say thank you to the team. And it, it's uh, very timely of the topics and our, our change. And I, I think if anyone doesn't know, we are, we are going through a systemic transformation from top to bottom on campus, uh, changing everything how we do from our data systems to our enrollment to our classes. Uh, the data visualization uh, was wonderful as an engineer. I really appreciate scatter plots and bubble maps. and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I understood what you were saying by looking at the graph. Um, you know, and we're, and we're trying to continue to say we have to serve the Long Beach of today. You know, and earlier today we adopted equity as a commitment uh, into our, our, our strategic plan and into our mission statement. Uh, and that's new and that's different, that's change, um, but we, we still live in America. You know, and I, I've heard very similar uh, statements from or experiences uh, as Mario shared today. Uh, on campus, off campus, myself as a student, I remember uh, I said, oh, I want to be a chemical engineering major, and my counselor said, oh, can you even spell that, you know, as, as a first response. You know, and, and today I have two engineering degrees, you know, so uh, it's, but it, it, it's, it's the, the, the black experience is uniquely American. You know, they, they say, you know, you're born black, you live black, you're going to die black. And it's, uh, as we continue to make the transformation on campus, it's important to, to focus on that. I know it's interesting that uh, <clears throat> I think it's 18 years since we had a black trustee, uh, and then this year we got two with Donnell and myself. <laughs> so we, we, we were making some change this year. But I was interested to ask Mr. or Dr. Lawrence, you know, 
I, I, it's great to see the gap change, you know, shrink uh, dramatically in your, in your presentation. Um, but you know, you, you talked about you, you learned it yourself, a research. Uh, you know, I've worked with Dr. Harper at USC, who's a nationally renowned um, racial equity professor. Can you share how did you come about the research, or was it a, an external training uh, like Dr. Harper uh, does that really help make that, that, that dramatic change? Yeah, sure. Actually, uh, Long Beach City College has partnered with USC and their Center for Urban Education over a number of years on various projects. So my mentor in this was Bistella Ben Simone. Um, I did my first equity project with her about 12 years ago and have done, I don't know, maybe, maybe five or six different equity-based projects over the years since then. And then the summer before last, she invited me to be an equity fellow and work with Q on developing their equity materials to train faculty. So that's where I've gotten a lot of my experience. And I'm grateful to them for that. Wonderful. And what would you say in your um, perspective we should do to replicate what uh, you've been able to do in your classroom? Yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, one of the, the sort of the framework that I'm taking to that that I, I'm hoping will be effective with with faculty is something that, that Q came up for their, um, for faculty to use reviewing their syllabi. Um, but it's five, I, they didn't really name them, so I've given them a name. I call them the five equity precepts. And it involves welcoming, because a lot of our students just don't feel welcome, don't feel like they're supposed to be here. They've heard the stigmatizing messages like you talked about before. Um, we've, we've already gone down that road with our push on the welcoming syllabi. So to work on that welcoming environment, a lot we can do in our classrooms there. Um, also validating students, which also ties into those stigmatizing messages. A lot of students have been told that they can't do it, that they can't even spell it. And so we, we need to, I mean, I, I think that the feeling that we really do believe in them and they can make it, which takes us to the next, the next aspect of the next precept is, is partnership, that we see our role is not just to deliver the materials, but we are partners in learning and we are going to reach out a hand and pull them up when, when needed. Uh, they represent, they're often left out of our, you know, students of color feel like our curriculum often doesn't speak to them. And the fifth is to demystify uh, college processes. They often don't have the strong social networks. Um, so we can't take things for granted. So I take time, say, teaching my students about ADTs in my class, making sure they're aware of those. We talk about financial aid, the UC Blue and Gold Plan the average earnings of various degrees. I, I feel like I can't simply teach philosophy that our students need other sort of network-based skills. So those five precepts, I think, if we, if we find ways to infuse them in everything we do, I think is a good way to kind of put it in a nutshell for faculty and staff and administrators. Thank you so much. Sure. And I had a follow-up question for Dr. Munoz. Uh, I, there was a lot of content I don't know what slide number it was, but uh, going through the uh, intervention um, programs that we had, um, there's the Viking Voyage program and so forth. Sure. Um, are we making those programs only available for full-time students, or are we also making those programs available for part-time students? So for this particular model, it's for the what we're doing with the Viking Advantage is targeting our direct high school matriculants who enroll full-time. Um, it's part of the operational first year success program of those that are coming through the College Promise. So as you know, the College Promise has, which is connected to both the Long Beach Promise and the statewide college, California College Promise, has the full-time student requirement. Um, we're looking, the welcome days and some of the other components are open up to any student, um, but the Summer Viking Voyage are, is intended for those students that are coming directly out of high school who enroll full-time. And to um, Dr. Van Wolkenberg's point, that represents about one third of our enrollment, the um, LBUSD, LBUSD high school matriculant. 
I know we're, we're 60% part-time students. Mm -hmm. Do they start, does that, is that a representative sample of the new students who are coming in, come in part-time, or does that, I don't, I don't know if that was on any of the graphs or you know, off, off hand of, or does that change over time that they started in full-time and they, they evolved to part-time? I can follow up with you on that. So we'll look into the data and I'll, I'll bring it to Dr. Romali so you can get those details. Great, and then the other thing is I know Long Beach um, is about 20% of um, foreign born uh, immigrant first or second generation population. Do we, in any of our intervention programs or onboarding, do we, are we considering a, a first generation um, model or uh, families that come from non-monolingual so I'm glad that you brought that up. As part of our Viking Summer Voyage, when we look at the curriculum, we're going to be looking at kind of cultural empowerment sessions as well as, um, and the gender binary doesn't always work anymore with a lot of, especially a lot of our emerging students that are coming directly out of high school. They're kind of rejecting the binary, so we're also looking at how to explore some of those concepts within the Viking Summer Voyage as well as um, with, a cal with a Promise 2.0. As the re at the request of our LBUSD partners, we are going to go out into the high school communities and have um, LB, um, Promise 2.0 Family Nights, or Noche de la Familia, depending upon which high school we're at, where we're going to offer, um, we're actually doing the parent letter in three languages, English, Spanish, as well as um, Kamai. Uh, Kamai. Kamai. Yeah, so those three languages we're going to have the letter translated into. Great. And last question. What did you say? Can you say something? Oh, I thought you said, um, uh, no, no, oh, no, no, I think maybe Dr. Scott, um, from, from a, it's great to see the ADT growth, and I know um, I'm biased because I'm an engineer, that we don't have ADT in engineering, uh, and I, I did notice we also did not have ADT in computer science, which is, I know is a high unit load, um, and I'm, I'm, we're, we're going to the league's conference uh, this weekend, and I've talked to a couple of legislators who are also engineers that we're gonna look at exploring, creating a, a model of engineering, um, ADT. But uh, can you, do we have it in our plan to do a computer science ADT uh, in the near future? Yes, absolutely. Um, the ADT in computer science is available for us and 36 out of the 114 colleges have one. Um, we are looking at that and we've been looking at it this week. Um, we are about four units over the 60 units, and so we need to pare down some of the courses. Um, some of the um, computer courses could be perhaps slightly they're four units, and if they could perhaps look at making them three units, that would help. And the science classes um, are slightly higher than some of our nearby um, competitors. So we need to shave four units off of that. We are committed to doing it and to working with the faculty collaborati collaboratively. They have to create the curriculum, um, but we know that it's in our students' interests and we know that our, the faculty care about the students. So we expect that we will be able to do that this year, yes. There is not currently an ADT for engineering. It is too high unit um, to actually have an ADT. Um, but I was told by Michelle grimes Hillman this morning that many of our students, uh, because of the coursework they're taking, automatically qualify for the ADT in math. Um, but that is an area to consider, and they, the, the legislature has been really strict on the 60 units, but it's very, very difficult to get an engineering degree under 60 units. So that's, and it's not, there just isn't one available for us. So I think I did 200 units. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know how many units yeah. it is. Yeah. Well, so, in, in thinking about that, um, uh, Luz Rivas, who's a MIT engineer, former colleague of mine, uh, we've been looking at if we integrate it into the early college, where you started, because uh, the, the Calc 1 is the, the gatekeeper barrier, and then the physics, you can't take calculus-based physics to take Calc 1, but then we have 5.5 .5 units for physics, and, um, and then you look at the CSUs, they don't have that many units, um, both That's calculus true. and physics-based. Um, we're, we're looking at trying to integrate with the early college. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's possible. As a way of getting units sooner to minimize the units you would do on campus. Yeah, it's possible to do that, where the, the Unified School District would have to allow us to offer some of the courses that they typically are offering now. And so that might uh, cause an issue with their faculty and perhaps their union. You know, if they offered, because we could offer classes that would give both college credit and high school credit. and but there would be an impact on their, on their 
their teachers. And so we have to be very sensitive to that. Um, we did put a sheet, by the way, in that additional folder with enrollment management materials that talks about the high unit. I saw that. Because yeah. I knew that you were going to ask. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Um, other trustees? Uh, Vice President Malu Ulu, you had a question, comment? Yeah, I have a couple questions. First of all, I'd like to thank the whole team for that exceptional and very enthusiastic report. Uh, all the effort that you put into it really shows. The data is astounding, uh, down to the fine details. I have a question, um, a couple of questions. One is for Professor Lawrence. Um, great job, by the way. You really inspire me um, with what you said, how you recognize the disparity between um, students of one ethnicity versus another and their performance in your class. That's, you know, it says a lot about your character for you to be willing to research that further. In your research of your own class, did you happen to find any particular data? Um, was there anything besides race that was impacting student performance in your class? Um, obviously, race was the factor, but was there anything in that? And the reason why I'm asking is because I found two things in my own classes. One is I found students who were single parents. I, that, that was all, every time I saw a student struggling in my class, without knowing their history, I, I just you know started talking and I realized that some of those were single parents with very little support. Um, they had to miss class because of childcare. Uh, they had to make tough choices, being able to enroll in other classes because they had to pay for childcare. So that was one factor that I kind of noticed a trend. And then I noticed um, another factor, um, it, it had something to do with ailing parents. Sometimes, no matter how old a student was in my class, if there was an ill parent that they had to take care of, not so much as an ill child, but an elderly parent, that was a factor that I, that I found to be compelling as to their performance in the class. Um, so I wanted to know if there was another factor. One other minor one that I found toward the end of um, my teaching career here is students who didn't have a car, obviously students who were homeless, but not as much as the performance of single parents. So did you happen to find anything in your research? Un unfortunately, I haven't seen data on single parenthood. Uh, you're absolutely right. It's it's definitely a concern, and we you know we have quite a few um, students who are parents or single parents, and either way, I in fact I was a, a parent while I was finishing my BA, and it's it's a whole different ball game. So I I don't think we're you know we're going to be soon working on the new student equity plan, and the state's going to provide us a, uh, quite a bit of data on a lot of parameters beyond race. Um, and Heather will always be <laughs> providing us, us data. And she might be able to speak to all of the different parameters that she's able to break out our data. But it is, I do tend to think that race tends to be pretty pervasive. Sure. Uh, a lot of folks want, well, we need to talk about socioeconomic class, right. but, but when you pair that with race, you talk about ailing parents. I, you know, I'm... I think one, one thing that faculty need to keep in mind is so many of our students have duties to their family that we would never have dreamed of, that they're supporting their families rather than their families supporting them. And so in a lot of ways, I think we, we, need to, we need to have those conversations. We need to build those relationships and really understand our students and sometimes be a little bit flexible on finding ways to help them achieve their goals. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. Um, just, just to piggyback, um, one particular female student who was struggling in my class, and I mean struggling physiologically, I, I would see her perspire, I, I thought she, I don't really know what I was thinking, but I knew there was something wrong. Um, after talking to her, I found that she'd had a baby, I think in early August, and she was still nursing. And she needed to find a place on campus during class. And that, you know, we found a nursing mom's room for her. We found a facility for her. And, you know, almost instantly you could see the pressure just disappear. You could see it evaporate because now she, now she could physically focus and she wasn't having those issues. Um, I have another question. 
Um, early in your report, um, gosh, I don't remember which one of you said it, but somebody talked about um, high demand classes where there was a graph and you showed how there were certain classes that were in high demand at certain times of the day. Um, obviously, we are addressing that by adding more classes at that time. I'm guessing that would be the solution. I'm just curious as to which are the high demand classes. Is it a certain English class, a certain math class? Are we needing to hire more faculty? What are we doing specifically to address that? Um, is it 8 to 10 a.m. block? Is it the 6 to 8 p.m. block? What, when is that? And, and I also think that we need to be, um, I think it would be prudent of us to let our students know. Maybe we could send out an email to say, these classes during these times, you know, are filled up faster than any other. So don't drop the ball. I think we, we need to be responsible to let the public know that this is an issue, we're aware of it, and this is what, you know, we propose to solve that problem. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. And I think Kathy probably can speak better to strategies. So if you'd rather just hear that, that's fine. If you want to hear any more detail well, about the data. Well, just which classes can... were they and what times? Yeah, so the data that we were presenting is was institution-wide data aggregated over a number of years to really just give us a snapshot perspective. That dashboard of data was provided to all the departments through the planning process. So then each department could kind of look within their area where there's high demand for classes. And so through the planning process, there were conversations going on about how that could be changed through the scheduling practices to help accommodate those needs and so it's kind of like a you know we need more than one mechanism for improving things and so that's one mechanism um, Michelle Grimes Hillman and the data that she's providing that Kathy also talked about is another mechanism so that as you know students are registering for courses there's sort of that war room mentality of like where are students going how can we get them into those places I know during the spring term, for example, the IE staff was hearing how we were canceling some classes. So they built out some dashboards that were also shared with department heads that showed, for example, where there were wait lists and then reaching out directly to those students on wait lists to then put them into classes at comparable times, comparable mm -hmm. materials, so that we were really making sure that people who were kind of stuck in the system, mm -hmm. their needs were getting addressed as well. And so again, it's sort of this real-time conversation and collaboration that we can figure out strategies. So there's long-term planning, and that's what that data was showing that's being used more for long-term planning, but then there's also this, you know, in the moment, what data can we use, how can we make those improvements rapidly? And so, Kathy, I don't know if you want to add to any of that as well. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we do have a list of the highest high demand courses, say tw the highest 20 or 30, which we could get to you certainly. Okay. Um, but it is a war room mentality. And as we get closer to the beginning of any term, we're looking daily and sometimes hourly at how things are filling. Um, we're looking at the wait list data. You know, sometimes students will. Um, they're waiting for a particular instructor, and that instructor's mm -hmm. the class is hugely impacted. The class is closed, the wait list is closed, but another class being offered at the same time may have open seats. So, you know, we have those kind of things to deal with too. But we are looking constantly, and Moises, who's up here, was the, um, he, he started the war room in math, which was looking daily, hourly at the, how things were filling, putting classes in when we needed to, watching how fast they enrolled, working with student services to add more when we needed to. Um, we have shadow classes in the mm -hmm. schedule, too, which you can't see. And so they're ghost classes. And we have rooms identified and faculty identified, times identified, and we open those as we have a need because we Got have it. a sense of what we're going to need. Okay. And do we need more faculty? In some cases, yes. We need more faculty trained and online. We're doing, we're doing everything we can to get more faculty trained and to hire fully trained online faculty because mm -hmm. you can see the need for that. But yeah, there's many, many strategies we're using, and we do understand. But, but prime time is prime time, and that sure. is tough to get sometimes. Well, I appreciate that. I, I never knew if my classes filled up quick, like the first day of enrollment because of me or because it was a general ed class. So I, I, nev I never got an answer to that question. I'm, I'd like to think it was because of me, but it was a GE class. OK, um, lastly, um, I love that you're targeting high school students. Bravo. Hello, especially with social media. Um, I'd like to uh, just really give kudos to the marketing team. Outstanding. I can't tell you how much I love the material, um, the direct mail uh, distribution. Um, I'm hoping that we can still incorporate email blasts. Even though social media is huge for our, our younger population, people still prefer to get a text. You know, just that text, this is happening, this is great. And uh, so again, great job to the whole team. But in closing, Mario, 
Um, you know, your disclaimer that, you know, you're not a comfortable speaker was just so far-fetched. You looked like you had prepared that and written it in advance and then memorized it, rehearsed it, um, so well-versed and um, no disability, obvious or apparent. Uh, you just did a really good job. Um, I'm sorry that um, anybody at the college has ever made you feel inadequate or not good enough. You know, we, we are actually committed um, to making sure that doesn't happen both to students and staff and faculty. Um, that's one of our goals is to make this a more um, warm campus. And I can tell you, um, I, you know, I wasn't here that long or that long ago, but um, things have gotten a whole lot better. You know, it, it's just, it's a, it's a more um, inclusive environment. It's more accepting, more tolerant, friendlier, but it's not that way for everyone. So I acknowledge that it's, you know, it has not been the case for you. And thank you for being open. And that took a lot of guts for you to stand up there and say what you said. So I really appreciate that. Thank you again for a really good report. Probably one of the best we've had. Thank you. I also wanted to thank you. I think it was phenomenal. Honestly, this is just, it, it moves me to see this level of rigor and everything we've asked for. I mean, it's, we, we've asked for it and you've executed. I, I have the saying that ideas are free, but execution is priceless. So I value those who know how to execute. Um, I do have a, qu a question. Before I uh, ask my question, I also wanted to echo my colleague's um, sentiment about the incredible work uh, that all of you have done. But uh, in particular, I wanted to mention that I have um, I was in a, we have a travel club at, at a place I live. Um, and, you know, I had met random members of the community come up to me. They're like, we saw your material. Can you bring some more? Can you put it out here? So kudos to you, Joshua Castellanos and your team. And it, you're, you're, you're doing so much. And, um, you know, there was a report that was recently issued that, that the importance of kindness in a workplace. And it really, you know, I know it's simple, but it's not easy. And, you know, I, I always am so inspired by Superintendent President Dr. Romali. I always ask her, I'm like, how, how do you do it? How is it that, um, you know, under pressure, under, I mean, we are a demanding bunch of, you know, we're a motley crew uh, <laughs> of a board over here. How do you do it, man? It's, it's, it's incredible. And I, I really am so inspired by you, Dr. Romali. It's incredible that I see the impact. Finally, finally, everything I've been dreaming about and asking for, it's finally coming to fruition. Of course, we're, uh, we need uh, uh, to chip away the imperfections. But I just wanted to put that on the record. And really, from the bottom of my heart, thank all of you. Um, and you are everything I've asked for um, and more. Um, so with that, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, the social justice program that was discussed. I think I, that's fantastic. Um, is that something that is um, in, in the works? Are we like going to see something uh, materialize uh, fairly soon? Um, the ADT and social justice, we are expecting that to go through curriculum this spring. So that it will need to go um, to all of you to approve, and then it will go to the chancellor's office. Um, but we expect that to be available. When would that be available, Michelle? Fall or spring of next year. Fall or spring of next year. And it does have the um, brand new LGBTQ studies course in it, which is a first for LBCC. So we're very excited about that, too. And then just another, I, I know this is a wide um, uh, spread conversation and topic amongst, uh, in the nation, financial literacy. And um, I know we have some aspects of it, but, um, or, or perhaps there was conversation about it. Um, one of the framings that I, I heard that was really astute was perhaps we can consider calling it wealth courses. 
and how much um, it has attracted more students and I certainly would want to take a, a course in wealth. I, I don't think anybody, um, perhaps some of my colleagues here can teach uh, about that uh, course um, since I can learn a few things there. Uh, but is that something that we're contemplating? Are we looking at that? Uh, you know, I don't know, but it's something I could raise with um, our Senate President, Jorge Ochoa, and our curriculum committee. Um, the faculty would have to develop such a course, but we can certainly bring ideas to them in um, our academic council meetings and talk to them about it. I don't know, and I don't know, um, Dean Grimes-Hillman, do you, have you heard of anything about that? <laughs> well, I just wanted to put the idea out there. Okay. You guys are okay. the experts. Uh, we're certainly uh, policy makers. And, um, if it's something that it seems like it would be a great way for us to increase our enrollment, um, both in the adult education mm -hmm. and uh, beyond. Um, and uh, lastly, I just wanted to also give another shout out to you guys. Um, it, we went through uh, to talk about enrollment management and the level of boots you put on the ground. Uh, for those of you who know, don't know, I'm not necessarily the best parade attendee and participant. Um, not a great waiver. I, I like you know doing the grunt work. And um, sure enough, we put everybody to work in every parade we've had with our flyers. And if enrollment doesn't go up, I don't know what else we're going to do. But I just want to commend you that you were all working so hard with our amazing collateral that we have that has come out of your shop, Joshua Castellanos. And it's been tremendous. Every person that I personally handed off to, and, and very clever, very clever, you guys have crayons in the back for the kids. It's just like brilliant. You think of everything. Every person I gave it to, they were excited to get it. So I was just thrilled to see that. Uh, I think we put all the trustees to work. and. Um, uh, Trustee Otto's wife was working hard as well, and it was fantastic in the recent parade. So I just want to also say, give you guys a big shout out and kudos, and thank you so much for the hard work that you do for us. It's amazing. It's making a difference. All right. If there is no any other questions, uh, oh, Trustee Otto, yes. So I, I, I really, really appreciated the uh, the presentation. In fact. Uh, if I was a betting man, which I sometimes am, I would have absolutely bet that you couldn't have got it done in that amount of time. But, so <laughs> you really kept it moving, and uh, and 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 yet uh, very, very, very uh, interesting. Uh, this is a very complicated thing that we're trying to do. Um, uh, on Monday, Chancellor Tim White for the CSU system. <clears throat> announced that due to the, the governor's new budget that um, they were going to enroll a whole bunch more students and they were going to open a whole bunch of uh, new classes uh, in 2017-18. The CSU system added 4,300 new course sections and they opened 90,000 additional seats for students in their system. Guess where they're going to come from? They're going to come from the high schools. They're going to bypass us, mm -hmm. and uh, it will make it much harder for us to get the FTESs that we're expected to get under the funding formula. And uh, so every time I feel like we ought to just sit down and say, what a great job we're doing, uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's something else. And mm -hmm. it's dynamic, it's interconnected, higher education, and so there's that. Um, if I was Rip Van Winkle and I went to sleep 14 years ago when I joined this board and woke up right now and said, oh, what's different? You know, what's, what's going on here? Uh, 14 years ago, none of this stuff was going on. None of it was going on. Faculty uh, wanted to teach their classes and be the best lecturers that they possibly could and to help, to help their students succeed in, in, in ways they were passionate about their students. But, um, but what we have now are all these tools that we never had before and a way of thinking about education that never occurred to anybody before 
at Long Beach City College. And I mean, it's been a gradual thing over time. <clears throat> uh, things have happened. The good news is it's pretty simple and it's the heart of education, what we're doing. And that's we're, we're developing ways to touch our students mm -hmm. and to develop relationships among ourselves and with our colleagues in ways that were never required before. And now they're not only required, they're sought after because we understand that that's the way that we make this complicated business of education successful. Uh, uh, Pr uh, Professor Lawrence, you, you were right on in saying, you know, I looked at this and I thought, I can figure this out and think about it better. I, I know uh, a, a professor here that I know who was, he thought he was doing great in the way he scheduled his classes and uh, then he thought about it and looked at it and he said, you know, I don't think I'm scheduling these classes for my students. I think I'm scheduling <clears throat> these classes for me or for ways that I think would be good pedagogically, but it doesn't take the whole experience into uh, consideration. And uh, so we changed. And it's the ability to do those changes that um, we're all involved with uh, at that uh, at this at this point that is so transformational, and we're doing uh, all this outreach. We're doing all this uh, uh, attempt to get people here, uh, and the and the only the other thing that's changed fundamentally is the access of data. You know what they used to say was, uh, "In God we trust." Uh, what we now say is, in God we trust, the rest of you bring data. Mm -hmm. And if you don't bring data, don't talk to me. <coughs> we could and now we have data. And we collect this data, and we use this data uh, to make decisions. And that is a, a profound uh, uh, change in what we do. You know, it's so delightful to listen to and talk to Te Heather. She talks a little fast for me sometimes, and, I, <laughs> and I'm trying to keep up with her and, and keep up with all of, uh, of all these points that, that they're trying to make. But, but in creating this college community, and we've, we've talked for years about these aha moments and how we get it when we work uh, together. I know that just the, earlier this month, there was a strategic enrollment management academy and training in Sacramento that we participated in. We brought all of our stakeholders to figure out how this works, which in, in and of itself, I think, was unique or new. And, uh, and everybody got to find out what everybody else wanted. And it makes a great atmosphere, because what we need to communicate and which, what I think we are communicating as a college is that this is a good place to be. And it's a fun place to be, and you can you can achieve your goals mm -hmm. if you come to Long Beach City College. Um, there was a uh, article in the New York Times uh, on Sunday that said, "Should uh, Bill James be admitted to the Hall of Fame uh, in base in Cooperstown in, in baseball uh, now?" And I bet most of the people here don't even know who Bill James is, but Bill James. Is the guy that brought you sabermetrics and all this analytic stuff that is all about baseball and, in fact, all sports now. And you know what? That's what we're doing too. It's exact. It's saying, I don't know what this is, but let me think about it. And it 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 it's a conversation that we're now all engaged with, and it's fabulous. I I think that the approach is terrific. It encourages us to work together to ask hard questions, to learn from one another, and it, it, it creates something out in the community that makes us uh, a very special place to be. So, so thanks for your presentation. Thank you, Trustee Otto. Thank you also for your great institutional insight and the historical background that you provided that some of us may not be aware of. Um, we will now move on to uh, consent uh, agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Baxter, seconded by Trustee Otto. Are there any questions, comments? Can we call for the vote? Madam Secretary. 
The motion was made by Trustee Baxter and seconded by Trustee <laughs> Otto. You're welcome. Aye. 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 Jones. Aye. Okay, great. We will now move on to um, item 6.1, revised board policy and administrative uh, regulation 3002, discrimination and harassment complaints and investigation. The, the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees approve and adopt revised board policy 3002, discrimination and harassment complaints and investigations as submitted. Um, this regulation uh, the, that I just read, it's submitted for imp informational purposes only and doesn't require board action. Um, and it's in accordance with established practices, the revised board policy and administrative regulation has been distributed, discussed, and approved by the President's Leadership Council. The revised board policy was submitted for first reading at the December 11th, 2018 <coughs> board meeting and is now being presented for approval. The changes are being recommended as a result of our ongoing review to ensure compliance with legal codes and align with current practices. I think there are some conflicting statements in this board action. This does require an action. Um, uh, it is a policy and a regulation. So the regulation part, we don't um, necessarily, we don't vote on, uh, that's for information, the policy part we vote on. So do I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Trustee Intuk, is there a second? Second. Second by Trustee Otto. Any questions, comments? Um, Was there any uh, substantial changes from the first reading to the second reading? Can't, it can't be. Uh, this is second, this is second reading. This is the second reading. So no changes. Yeah. Call, uh, are there any questions, comments, any other? Okay, let's call for the vote. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. <coughs> Student Trustee Jones. Aye. Item 6.2, revised board policy and administrative regulation 3031, prohibition of harassment. Uh, the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees approve and uh, adopt revised board policy 3031, uh, prohibition of harassment as submitted. In accordance with established practices, the board policy and administrative regulation has been distributed, discussed, and approved by the President's Leadership Council. The revised board policy was submitted for first reading at the December 11, 2018 Board of Trustees meeting and is now presented for approval. The changes are being re recommended as a result of our ongoing review to ensure compliance with legal codes and align with current pa practices. Do I have a motion? Motion made by Trustee Baxter, seconded by Vice President Malaulu. Is, are there any questions, comments? Hearing none, call for the question. Madam Vir Secretary. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. Student Trustee Joe. <coughs> Aye. We will now move on to item 6.3, employment contract with Dr. Mike Munez, Vice President of Student Support Services. Uh, the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees approve the employment contract for Dr. Mike Munez, Vice President of Student Support Services as submitted. The employment contract provides a term of employment from January 24, 2019 to June 30th, 2021. The contract provides for annual compensation of 199722 along with health and benefit, welfare benefits and life insurance. Do I have a motion? So moved. A motion made by Trustee Intuk. Is there a second? Second by Vice President Malaulu. Are there any questions, comments? I have a comment. I wanted to um, say it <coughs> gives me great pleasure to approve this contract tonight. And I'm thrilled that we have Dr. Munez on board. I've heard from multiple sources, um, and I do have 
ears and eyes close to the ground here and outside of the college and rave reviews. So um, this is exciting, and I'm excited to support it. And uh, Trustee Intuk, would you like to say a few words? Yes, just wanted to echo uh, congratulations to Dr. Munoz. Really appreciate your leadership, uh, your personality, your presence. Uh, you really made a, uh, a strong showing uh, here on campus, and you have exceeded the, the glowing expectations that came from Rio Hondo before you showed up. So uh, thank you, and, and please keep up the good work. Vice President Malaulu. Same thing, I'd just like to echo that. Um, one thing that I, I have heard a lot of is the Welcome Center. Um, and I, I would just like to give props to the team and I know Vice President Munoz oversees that and um, I have heard many good things about the Welcome Center and the presence throughout campus, not just of the physical facility, but the outreach that it's doing and putting people strategically in places, especially now with the beginning of the new semester upon us. We're getting a lot more visitors on campus to enroll or to inquire. So that Welcome Center is, is a breath of fresh air. Thank you very much. All right, if there are no more questions and comments, I'll call for the question. Madam Secretary. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Joe Intek. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. And Sunny Zia. Aye. Congratulations, Mike. We will now move on to item 6.4, employment contract with Heather Van Valkenburg, Dean of Inf Institutional Effectiveness. Um, the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees uh, improve, approve the employment contract for Heather Van Valkenburg, Dean of Institutional Effectiveness, is submitted. The employment contract provides for a term of employment from January 24, 2019 to J June 30th, 2021. The contract provides for annual compensation of $154,083 along with health and welfare benefits and life insurance. Do I have a motion? Second. Moved by Trustee Baxter, seconded by Trustee Intuk. Are there any questions, comments? I just want to say, uh, I was looking at one slide. Trustee Intuk. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And I, and, I, and I heard the student in my head going, I can't get the class I want at the time I want it. And I was like, there it goes. That's a slide that students need to see to show that we're, we're listening and, and we're adapting. So thank you for, for bringing all of that together in, in a very compact uh, format for us. So thank you. Look forward to working with you. Continue to work with you. I, I also wanted to echo Trustee Intook's um, uh, sentiment. And then just, uh, I'm really thrilled, Heather. Um, I just love saying your last name. And I'm going to keep practicing it. It's a tongue twister. Um, uh, it's, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna have uh, tonight. I'm gonna dream about you <laughs> saying it like over and over again. Uh, congratulations, you. I've, I mean, I've seen your work. It's impressive. Um, you're. I mean, all of you. You're like I said. You guys are the dream team, and uh, you know uh, they say great leaders know how to pick great uh, leaders as well. And that's uh, again. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Romoli for having. Um, to have picked you and rewarding talent, all of you. Um, with that, is there anybody else? Um, I'm going to go ahead and call the question. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. And Sunny Zia. Aye. <coughs> Congratulations, uh, Heather. Um, Ms. Va Van Valkenburg. Um, item 6.5, employment contract with Kathleen Scott, Executive Vice President of Academic Affairs. Um, their recommended action, bear with me, uh, is that the Board of Trustees approves the uh, employment contract for Kathleen Scott, Executive Vice President of Academic Affairs, as submitted. The employment contract provides for a term of employment from G January 24, 2019 to June 30th, 2021. The contract provides for annual compensation of $224,034, along with health and welfare benefits and life insurance. Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved. A uh, motion ma moved by Trustee Otto, seconded by Trustee Baxter. Comments, questions, trustees? I, I have to tell you that it gives me great pleasure and joy, um, Dr. Scott. Uh, I know you covered for uh, 
Superintendent President Dr. Romali during her maternity leave, and I had the great pleasure of seeing firsthand what you're capable of. Um, you're amazing. We're lucky to have you. I have been anticipating this, and I am so excited to approve your uh, contract tonight and um, vote yes on it. And um, I, I'm just really thrilled. This, I just don't want to jinx it, so <laughs> I'll I'll I'll, um, I'll reserve uh, my comments for later. Um, more more compliments. So uh, with that, if there are any uh, yes. Trustee and and took. I would just like to say uh, congratulations and thank you, Dr. Scott. I know you work eight days a week and uh, commute halfway across the country every every time you get a day off. So um, and, and we were talking earlier. You are uh, uh, are experiencing scope creep where uh, <laughs> you, your plate keeps growing and uh, you're able to manage everything. So thank you for all your your hard work you're doing on behalf of the students. I love that clinical vernacular. I use it all the time. It's awesome. Scope creep. Yet, um, uh, all right. Go ahead. Uh, let's go ahead and call for the vote, um, Madam Secretary. Please, Virginia Baxter, Aye. Vivian Malaulu, Uduak Joe Intuk, Aye. Doug Otto, Aye. and Sunny Zia. I with pleasure. Congratulations, uh, Executive Vice President Kathleen Scott. All right. We will now move to. Uh, item 7.1, Board Policy and Administrative Regulation 5021, Services to Students with Disabilities. Uh, the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees approve and adopt Board Policy 5021, Services to Students with Disabilities, as submitted. New Board Policy 5021 uh, and New Administrative Regulations 5021. Uh, it is for uh, the uh, the regulation is submitted for information purposes doesn't require board action the policy does um, this is in accordance with the established practices the new board policy and administrative regulation has been distributed it's been discussed and approved by the president's leadership council and the bo new board policy was presented for first reading at the december 11 2018 board of trustees meeting is now being presented for approval uh, this is a new policy and uh, regulation for the district. It establishes guidelines for the services provided by the district to students with disabilities. The addition of the board policy and administrative regulations being recommended as a result of our ongoing review to ensure co compliance with current education and legal codes and accreditation standards. Do I have a motion? So moved. As sec uh, moved by trustee. Intuk, seconded by Trustee Otto. Um, boy, you guys are fast tonight. I love it. Um, this side is winning on the <laughs> motions. Um, are there any questions, comments? I'm glad we're uh, uh, updating these policies that uh, we've done tonight. And so um, thank you, uh, Dr. Molly and her staff for preparing this. Great, thank you. Um, if there are no more questions or comments, I'll call for the question. Um, Madam Secretary. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And Student Trustee Jones, excuse me. <laughs> Aye. All right, great. Item 7.2, Board Policy and Administrative Regulation 5022, preferred first name. Uh, the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees approve and adopt Board Policy 5022, preferred first name is submitted, and the Administrative Regulation 5022, preferred first name is submitted for information purposes only for the regulation, and this is in accordance with our established practices. And the first reading was read, um, well, it was presented on December 11, 2018, and it is a new policy and regulation for the district. It establishes guidelines that allows students to identify themselves with a preferred name different than their legal name. The addition of the board policy and administrative regulations being recommended as a result of our ongoing review to ensure compliance with current education and legal um, codes and accreditation standards. Uh, do I have a motion? Uh, President Zia, I'd, I'd like to make a motion to uh, continue this item to next month. Uh, I'm strongly in support of it and it was the original uh, requester of this motion, but um, I, I spoke with Dr. Romali and, uh, and and other staff that there were some community members who wanted to review and have input uh, before we finalize it. And, uh, and I think the best way to make sure that happens is, is give us a little bit more time 
to have some more eyes on on the policy if there's a second to that motion second okay so let me just make sure um, are we so were you substituting the motion to con you're, you're making a motion to continue this to February February is that what okay um, all right are there any questions comments so we're gonna take a vote on continuing item uh, 7.2 to the February board meeting, February 13th, is that right? Uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so let's go ahead and take the vote, Madam Secretary. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Vivia Malaulu. Aye. Uduwak Joe Intuk. Aye. Doug Otto. Aye. Sunny Zia. Aye. And Student Trustee Jones. Aye. All right, we will now move on to reports. Uh, item 8.1, Academic Senate President Report. Um, Academic Senate President Jorge Ochoa, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, I'm, I'm trying to get the microphone to work. Uh, first of all, I wanna congratulate Matt uh, for his new appointment. Uh, we're gonna be doing a lot of good work uh, with equity, so congratulations, Mike. Uh, Dr. Scott, congratulations. I had the pleasure of working with you for a couple of years and looking forward to that great work uh, for our students. Uh, the rest uh, is uh, a reminder to all faculty that the winter quarter ends on Tuesday and the spring semester begins on Wednesday. I know it's uh, important. It's a change from the norm that we've been used to. Uh, but just uh, be aware of that. Uh, and uh, I just wanna let you know that the work from the curriculum and the Senate will resume in the month of February, and I'm looking forward to uh, keep uh, providing and bringing uh, the board more uh, items for you to approve and courses and uh, other uh, items that need your approval. So thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Um, item 8.2, Classified Senate President. Annie Engel, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, President Zia. Uh, just wanted to say that uh, the enrollment management presentation was very good, and I think it's very important for Classified and everyone at the college to understand uh, the importance of, of being on top of our game. And uh, we're gonna do our best as classified to support uh, enrollment management, matriculation, and everything we can. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, Annie. Uh, okay, item 8.3, Board of Trustees reports. I'll start with Dr. Baxter. Trustee Baxter, if, if you are ready. <laughs> I, I am ready. <laughs> You're always ready. <laughs> uh, these are the activities that I've taken uh, place in um, since our last meeting. Uh, first of all, I'm on the California Council for Equity and e Equality and Justice Board, and we met um, in January. And I want to let the public know and the board know that uh, Vivian Malaulu has been selected to be the dinner chair of the CCEJ Humanitarian Awards dinner, which is May 14th. So. We need to put that on our calendar so we can go and salute Vivian. Uh, then um, I, uh, uh, with Marlene Dunn and uh, Sean Ravel, I toured all the different plaques on campus. Um, uh, there are a number of plaques, uh, legal and illegal, uh, under trees, and some were put there without uh, authorization and, and others were, and so, um, Marlene suggested we go around and, and just check them all out. That was a very interesting uh, morning that we spent. Uh, then I attended the State of the City Address by Mayor Garcia, and uh, of course we were acknowledged, and um, it was very exciting to be part of uh, that festivities. Um, uh, last Wednesday I gave a speech to the Suraptimus Club of Long Beach, um, and they, uh, uh, heard about my speech on um, First Ladies. Um, I also attended the foundation breakfast, which was last Thursday. And um, then I um, was interviewed by, uh, on community college leadership by a representative from Loyola Marymount University on Friday. And then on Saturday, I spoke to 200 women in, 
uh, in a group called PEO, and their name is secret. And so you can't, nobody can know what PEO stands for. But it was amazing. Um, they're 150 years old, founded in 1869 in Iowa. And uh, it was uh, great to see so many ladies there. And they like my sp speech besides. Uh, it was on uh, women in U.S. government. And um, it's amazing with the Me Too movement and everything, how many more senators and congresswomen have been uh, elected and how many more women are already declaring that they're running for the presidency. So it should be very interesting as a former history teacher. I also uh, attended the California Retired Teachers Luncheon and, of course, the State of uh, the Port Luncheon today. And then two more things. Um, starting next Tuesday, I'm teaching a class through the Senior Studies uh, Center, which I've been doing for five years, uh, entitled How to Write Your Autobiography. And it's uh, so much fun to listen to the stories that the students uh, come up with as they're trying to put their life together. And the idea is that you're sharing your, your life for people you will never know, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. And so um, I've had a lot of fun with this, and I'm, I'm glad that I'm back uh, teaching it again uh, this semester. And also I wanted to ask the trustees who are going to the Capitol on Monday, next Monday, uh, there will be a briefing on housing and food insecurity from 4 to 5.30 and in State Capitol Room 444. So I cannot go uh, to the legislative summit, but those of you who are going, I have it written on this lovely piece of paper, if one of you would attend and come back and, and give um, us some information, that would be wonderful. Uh, as you know, Trustee Z and I are very involved in housing and security and our group is, is just moving right along, and um, so um, anything we can learn from the legislature would be great. Thank you. Vice President Malaulu. Sure. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome all of you, uh, including our viewing audience, to the Pacific Coast Campus. This is in my trustee area. So it's always a privilege for me to host at least one board meeting here at this campus. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank the staff. I know it's not easy, especially our uh, audio, visual, and technical teams um, for what you are able to make happen uh, under the leadership of Board Secretary Jackie Hahn and Michelle Reese. Thank you to all the hands that took part in setting up these tables and our microphones and cameras. So I know it's not easy. I really appreciate it. Thank you for making it happen. To everybody else, Happy New Year. Welcome back. Hope you all had a restful break, uh, that you are um, finishing strong the winter session and preparing to start strong our spring semester. Um, since our last board meeting, uh, we uh, were able to fellowship with so many of you during our staff and faculty and community holiday events. Uh, really grateful for that time. Also, um, we, uh, I, I think it happened before, but we did finish our holiday parade season. And I just wanted to acknowledge, uh, which I neglected to do, is the choir, the carolers who uh, participated, and uh, it's just kind of neat to see them out there, and I look forward to hopefully having them at the um, Daisy Lane Christmas Parade. I, I don't think I said that at the last board meeting, and I intended to, um, which is also in my area that runs through Wrigley. I, I'd love to have the carolers um, be a part of that in that part of the community. It would be a real nice treat for that part of town. Um, since then, let's see, uh, I attended the uh, Board of Governors breakfast last week. All five trustees were in attendance, which was awesome. I think it's the first time um, that all five trustees, remember, we, we all have jobs, so it's a, it's a time commitment um, to be present at so many of these events, and it was neat to have all five of us there at the same time. That, I don't think that's ever happened, at, to be there. What's that? Within your memory. Well, since I've been here. <laughs> I can't, I can't speak for previous You've got boards. To go back 90 years. Yeah, but for as long as I've been on the board, I've never seen all five trustees at a Board of Governors breakfast, so that was neat. 
Um, we were at the Martin Luther King Parade this past weekend. Uh, last week we also attended the uh, State of the City, which was great. Really enjoyable to see Long Beach City College get um, the props that it deserves, not just for the College Promise, but mainly because of the College Promise. And then today we were at the um, Port of Long Beach, State of the Port. I want to share something with you. Um, for years and years, whenever we drove around um, my family, my kids, somebody would always say, oh, look, Long Beach City College, because we would see a banner or a flyer on a bus or at a bus stop. And it was occasional. Um, I wish I had a dollar for every time one of my kids says, Mom, look, it's another Long Beach City. Mom, Long Beach, what are you guys doing? It's everywhere. I don't think you could drive down a block without seeing something Long Beach City College, which is fantastic. Um, I understand that um, everything is falling well within budget. We're taking care of a lot of costs on our own. We're, uh, the reproduction costs, everything is in-house, the design. Um, that's just amazing. I remember spending so much money on one bus billboard in the past. And I think what we're paying now for all this heavy-duty marketing is falling well underneath the cost of that. I know that's an exaggeration, but you get the point. Um, so thank you for the marketing my family is noticing. I mean, I hear it all the time driving down the street, so I hope everybody else's family is noticing. And um, the last thing is the website. I just want to commend the team. I know that um, I gave uh, props for the Welcome Center. The website, uh, I really like the phrase, and I think it was Joshua who said it about Chad or Brad. I'm not sure, but it was intuitive one or two clicks. I, somebody said that earlier today. I wish I had written it down. Mike Mike said it. I wish I had written that phrase down. What did you say? It was too, yeah, it was too, yeah, you said something really catchy. It was too intuitive. Some, too click and I don't know what you said. Whatever, too intuitive clicks. Yeah, okay, so that's going to be our website phrase. Too intuitive clicks. That just rolls off. So thank you very much. I've been uh, able to use the website because of the new email, so I appreciate that. And then also, Tim is not here anymore, but I wanted to personally thank him for saving my uh, phone and laptop. Myra, all of you guys, I've been, I've been off email um, for a long time. I locked myself out. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a great second semester. We'll see you guys soon. Trustee Otto. Uh, happy New Year. Looking forward to the term, and uh, uh, and that's all. You know, it's getting late. I'm sure the rest of you need to talk about it. Trustee Antuk? Uh, sure. Hey, thank you. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, uh, I made the circuit of parades, so uh, Belmont Shore uh, Christmas Parade. Uh, was there at the MLK Parade. Um, uh, attended the AFT holiday party. And I, I did not know that Annie was such a great singer. And we really appreciated her guitar playing and setting the mood. Uh, it was a really nice festive end of the semester, end of the year event. And I'm looking forward to next year. We've already instituted some new changes and look forward to it being uh, an even better celebration. Uh, I didn't make the historic uh, Board of Governors breakfast uh, last, last week, yeah. was it? And um, was there at the State of the City. I still I need to talk to Vice Mayor D. Andrews. Uh, he doesn't know how to pronounce my name yet, so I gotta, I gotta, I gotta call him to the side. Um, <laughs> but no, we're <laughs> food walk is too different. Um, I am uh, taking uh, uh, a certificate program at Dominguez Hills. Uh, I'm taking a two-unit class in the American Community College. And it's uh, it's about a 600-page book. Um, you know, and my background is I've been teaching at the university level, and so it's a, a community college teaching uh, certificate program that culminates with an internship, uh, but I gotta find a, a district that'll let me teach. Uh, yeah, I can't do it here, I gotta do it somewhere else. So, but I've just learned so much in uh, the couple weeks I've been in the class and it's really a nice supplemental. And I'll, I'll make sure I'll bring my textbook uh, next month so anybody wants to read it, it's, uh, it's quite ferocious. Um, yeah, and then lastly, uh, or two things before, uh, one, um, it, it's been shared already, but uh, on February 5th, uh, here at PCC campus, we're going to be hosting the uh, Long Beach uh, Equity Profile launch. Uh, I've been part of a group the last six months working with USC and Dr. Pastor 
and Policy Link, which is a think tank out of uh, Oakland. I hope, uh, Mario, uh, you can make it. It's open, free to the public. Uh, we've set aside uh, space for students to attend. Uh, it's going to be 9.30 here at the PCC campus uh, in the GG 235 upstairs, 38, 38. So it'll be upstairs here uh, across the parking lot. Um, it's going to be uh, a big event. Citywide leaders will be there, you know, talking with the organizers like, well, where in Long Beach is the best place to talk about equity? It's Long Beach City College and it's at the PCC campus. So, you know, there's, we don't have SAT requirements and, you know, and, and all the barriers of access that other places have that, you know, we, we're, we're open for everybody. So uh, that's really going to be uh, a big event. And if you can make it, I highly encourage you. And I'll, I'll tell you the, the secret at the end is uh, it hurts everybody when we have inequity. And they quantified it that we are losing $500 billion with a B and economic value in our city due to inequities. If we could just get parity, not uh, everyone, you know, flip-flop, but just to get parity, $500 billion is lost. And you think about tax revenue and supporting the college and supporting public services that uh, we all cherish, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's in all of our interests, and it's not a net sum game, but if we, have, if we address equity, someone has to give it up. We, we all win. It's, it's growing the pie and getting a bigger boat. Uh, that we all get to participate in. So uh, if you can, February 5th, please mark your calendars. And then lastly, since our, I, I found out after our last meeting, but it happened before, my, one of my predecessors in uh, Area 1, Trustee Darwin Thorpe, passed away uh, last November. And he was a um, former professor at Compton College, uh, Area 1 former personnel commissioner, uh, before he was on the board, and then after he was off the board, he was back on the Personnel Commission. But there's going to be a celebration of his life uh, this Saturday at the Unitarian Universalist Church on Atherton and Bellflower. It's going to be at noon, uh, Saturday, January 26th, uh, if anyone uh, is interested and available to attend. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it'd be nice. And also, I'd like to ask if we can convene uh, our meeting tonight in his memory. That's all I have. Thank you, Trustee Antuck. Uh, Vice President Malauulu, I believe you wanted to say. Uh, yeah, I, was the one I, I forgot was to share one quick thing. Um, this little insert is, I, can't, I cannot believe I just dropped that. I'm sorry. The little insert that has the Viking, thank you, Kathy, that has the Viking on it um, that we distributed at parades and events. It's got the little crayon. I have to share something that happened to you. We were at the MLK parade. And a lot of people were walking around passing these out. And I was on the float, and I saw this little boy. And I, I wish I had a video of this, because it really made my day. He gets it, he's looking at it, and he's kind of looking around. And then he, I mean, it, he looks at the float, and he goes, it's him. Oh, and he's so pointing at our Oli, the Viking, on the float. But he shrieked. He just, you know, that, that innocent childlike shriek he was like it's him and he's looking at this picture and he's looking at Oli and I don't know you know what this little boy's journey in life will be his educational path will take but I can tell you that he will forever remember seeing Oli in a parade and he will forever remember having this whether he colored it or not kept it or threw it away he made a connection to Oli, and if, if that's his memory of why he wants to attend college, I'm just really happy that I was a part of that. So this, this has, you know, outreach. It, it has ramifications, and it is out there. And that, that little boy, if you, if you had seen it, it would have made your day, too. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Malaulu. Yeah, that was the one I was talking about. It, it just, uh, everybody was all over it. Um, I am not going to report on the litany of events I have attended. It's already been uh, reported on. Um, but I do want to mention that as part of our College Promise 2.0 efforts and the great work our administration is doing, we're reaching out to businesses. And you're going to be hearing more about that as Dr. Superintendent President Dr. Molly reported earlier about February end of February and then um, also March. So you'll, you'll hear more about that. But I wanted to uh, especially recognize uh, one business uh, that has reached out. Um, they have been uh, pretty much uh, at the forefront uh, without us even formally getting into the nitty gritty. And that's the Lee Andrews Group. And 
they reached out to me, the president, Stephanie, um, she's fantastic, and uh, Stephanie Graves, and she says that they, they, they won a project with Metro and a special project that was for the blue line, and they want to hire our students. It's 16 students and uh, part-time shift. I've, I've passed it on to our administration. I wanted to put it out there as well for our wonderful students. Um, it's pretty, it seems like they're going to be working very well with us. The shifts are three, uh, 6 to 9 a.m. and 3 to 7 p.m. Um, and it's uh, at uh, the Blue Line stops. And uh, this is, it's a fantastic. It's, it starts immediately. It's, it's an Im imminent need. Um, and, you know, she is the kind of person that if she really sort of sees our, the talent of our students, I think they have a great shot of getting more um, long-term opportunity with her firm. And I just wanted to put that out there. I wanted to thank Leandra's group for um, being one of the first um, uh, firms and businesses that want to be at the forefront and hire our students and throughout our campaign of hiring more interns as we do a broad uh, effort of reaching out to businesses and bringing them on board with our college partnership, College Promise Partnership 2.0 with industry collaboration. Um, with that, I am going to move on to item 9.1. And excuse me, uh, 8.5, uh, 8.4 board travel. Yes, student trustee, I, I apologize, forgive me. I'll make it up to you. Um, student trustee, Danelle Jones, forgive me, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Oh, no problem, no problem. Um, uh, so we're now at item 8.4, board travel. Uh, do we, I don't believe we have any to report on, but we do have uh, ones coming up uh, this weekend, as Trustee Antuk mentioned. Trustee Antuk and Trustee Otto are going to the state capitol. Um, there's going to be the CCLC um, conference, and if any one of you want to speak to that, um, if you don't, I can move on to the next item. Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, so we're, it's not, it's, uh, and then afterwards we're going to have a report on it. Trustee committees, is, are there any? I don't have any reports from any committees. Now we're going to move on to item 9.1. This is um, the trustee request uh, or recommendation for future agenda items or reports, uh, but only with the consent of the, of the board. Um, we have attached to the agenda item uh, highlighted projects that the superintendent president, Dr. Ramali, is leading the college on, on during the 2018-2019 year. All of them are high priority because they, A, align with our enrollment management plan, B, align with our strategic plan, um, contribute to a strong fiscal position, comply with state and federal regulations and or accreditation requirements, and um, contribute to safe and healthy college environment, and F, contribute to a culture of civility and kindness to all people. Um, with the student-centered funding formula guiding our decisions, our uh, goal is to dovetail these ob objectives with the maximization of this funding formula to maintain fiscal stability for the district. We will be executing the portions of the enrollment management plan and strategic plan that have data that prove that they drive student success at the highest rate and place lower priority on those that have a smaller success impact. All strategies are aimed at increasing enrollment, retention, persistence, course success, completion, and transfer. The project list is not comprehensive because smaller projects are born out of larger projects that build up to the co completion of said larger project. But the list is uh, reflective of the main pro projects that LBCC is working on this year. There are no completion dates associated with these projects because they are ongoing in nature, and we will provide a status update at the end of the day of, our, uh, of the progress on major projects. Um, I understand that uh, Superintendent Pres President Dr. Molly, again, you've done um, 
a fabulous job of attaching the project list and your priority list. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, comments about this, uh, or anyone else would like to add anything, uh, I want to open it up to the board. Oh, and Superintendent President Dr. Molly, go ahead. Yeah, we've had a lot of good input from the board members on how we can fine tune this to make it more effective, and then how we can do the best job in terms of being the most responsive. Um, as recently as last evening, the vice presidents and I met to see how tight we can get this. So if you, as you look through this and you have some thoughts, please do call me as you get a moment to give me your suggestions so that we can turn this into uh, the most effective report we possibly can. Fantastic. Thank you, Superintendent President Dr. Ramali. Um, again, this was the first time we brought this to, it was brought to the board was last board meeting. And I like the fact that we have priorities set and um, the board concurred. So um, if there are no other comments or questions, Trustee Intuk. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm glad we were able to review this and bring it back another time. I think we should look at um, uh, categorizing and being more clear on, on the process of if, if you know items should come to the board that are going to be on the to-do list. Uh, it should be, I think, through regular motion and vote so that it's not unclear what, what was said or what was not said or um, I know for me like I look at some of my list of items the especially summer of 2018 those are items I talked to Dr. Romali about but I never brought to the board for official action I think probably don't I think they're all great ideas but I don't think they, they belong on the uh, to-do list right now mm -hmm. um, the other thing we spoke about last time that I don't know if it's we end up making a policy on this or a guideline or however we want to work on it, but uh, you know, saying that the requests should be numbered, dated, um, ha you know, within a two-year window from um, time, you know, because we we're all for sure going to be on the board together for two years, and then in two years from now, you know, things could change. Uh, but it's thinking about it in a in a in a, a broader sense, and this is just a request I want, you know, sh should be done next week. You know, it's it's something broader, and think how does it, you know, connect? And I, and I think the other thing is. If we did it in writing and we figured out where in the strategic plan do you think this connects? You know, where do you think in the mission this connects? Uh, and if you have to write it down, you really got to think about it. And so um, I think, you know, fine tuning the process, however we, maybe, you know, if we want to make a future agenda, I don't know about it or not, but however we want to talk about it, I think we need to, to tighten the process. But also just want to uh, recommend removing anything I have summer 2018 that. Uh, didn't come up, so I think that'll shorten the list down a little bit. So, so Trustee and if I may make a suggestion, perhaps um, you can go through the ones that are a priority for you, and you can distinguish between what's an idea versus what you want to bring to the board. Sure. Um, so we can have a revision to this and make um, uh, e ease it on staff a bit on like which ones are the most pivotal for your yeah uh, I, it, okay uh, for your thought process and what you'd like to discuss as an agenda item. Maybe you could work with the staff and um, Superintendent President Dr. Ramali, and then maybe we can have a revised version of this. Would that work? How does that work for you, doc, uh, Trustee Intuk? Yeah, yeah, if it, yeah, that's not a problem. Is everyone in agreement? Are there any? Are there any other items that anybody else introduced or? I, I, guess I don't I believe I saw anything that was new, uh, but then again, um, I re recognize that it, the page count changed from eight to ten. So, but I couldn't find what if there was anything new. It seemed that they were pretty much Just added further details as to how things. I got gotcha. you. Okay, yeah, because the items seem very familiar. All right. If there are no other questions, comments, I will now move on to item. 10.1, public comments on non-agenda items. Um, this, a total of three minutes will be allotted to each speaker with a maximum of 20 minutes to each subject unless extended by the board president. I don't have any car, uh, requests tonight and we will not have a second closed session. Um, I, uh, item 12.1, uh, the next board meeting is going to be, I stand corrected, it, it will be on February 27, 2019, 
not February 13, 2019. Um, and it will be held at the Liberal Arts Campus, uh, Building T, Room 1100. Closed session will start at 4.30 and open session at 5.30 p.m. Before we adjourn, I'd like to honor Trustee Intuk's request of adjourning in uh, memory of uh, former trustee Darwin Thorpe. We can take a moment. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. This is stuck. <laughs>